<coughs> Good morning, everybody, and welcome to what's going on here. We're in Plattsburgh, New York. We're not in, a, in the Alabama. We have not joined the Army. We've not joined the Reserves or the National Guard, but we're at the National Guard building in Plattsburgh, New York, between Plattsburgh and Marsonville. We're in Morrisonville, then. That's the place for it. We call yes, it. We're in Morrisonville, New York. I'm Bob Venn, Calvin Castine with the camera, and welcome to our Sunday show. Uh, on our right, if you don't recognize the face, you certainly will recognize the name. It's young Jim Gallo. Is that right? That's right. Do you know that older Jim Gallo in more? I'm sure it is my father. That's your dad, right? And you're one of how many children? Four. Four children. Who are your brothers and sisters? Tell my us. brother is Jeff, and I have Jennifer and Jacqueline are my sisters. My mother's Jeanette. Okay. And uh, U.S. Army. Uh, we're here to find out what the National Guard is and uh, what they do. Uh, you, I'm sure you've seen the building when you've come to the county fair. Jim, how long have you been in the National Guard? I've been in three years this month. Two, two this, this month will be three years. Three years, okay. So you have a full-time job besides this. This is not a, a job. It's a... Is that correct? Is it a job? It's an additional weekend deal? It's like a part-time job. Part-time job. What are you doing full-time? I'm a New York State Correction Officer. Oh, so you you got it all ways here, huh? Yes. Okay, now, this is Thursday, middle of the day. You're not working uh, at your regular job today? No, I get today off so I can come in and do something for the Armory. Okay. Now, there are a lot of people. I've noticed at a lot of offices, and I've seen 10 or 12 people. These are people who are all part-time, or National Guard is part-time? Right. Some people are here. Uh, they're active National Guard, which means they're here every day to run the day-to-day -day details of the Armory. But most of the people do have jobs on the side, and they just do it their one week in a month, two weeks okay. a year. You don't have any retired people. You don't want old people like me here. They've got to be young, <laughs> right? You've got to be able to do it, be active and all of that? Well, I'm sure we find a job for you. You can never find a job for me, yeah, but I, I don't do very well with a broom, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> no. In our background, we're going to be talking with several people, and uh, I'm running here with an ear problem this morning, so if I'm talking loud, forgive me. Maybe I should be on the other side, but uh, we're going to be talking with other people, and we're going to be finding out the difference between the National Guard and the Reserve from somebody else, I understand. Sure. Uh, Sergeant Dick Dixon. Sergeant Dixon, yes. all right. Uh, what is your rank? I'm a sergeant, E5. Does it say that anywhere here? How do I know that? On my tabs and my shoulder. Oh, oh way up there, of course. You can hardly see it. Of course. Okay, there it is. So, what's E5 mean? Uh, you're, it's enlisted, you're a sergeant. Uh, I'm a team leader with the company, which means I lead three other people on my team, four people, depending on how many people you have in your team, and uh, part of a squad, which the large element would be part of a platoon and then upwards to a company, and it keeps on going up. Okay, we're going to see a, some diagram that will kind of explain this to us. Sure. Okay. Tell me, I don't know how we got here this morning, but uh, how did we get to the National Guard? Was this your idea, Calvin's, or what? Uh, actually, right now, the company, we're looking for people that want to join, and uh, as a recruiting event, we came up with the idea of getting some local coverage and letting people know what we do, uh, where we're at, and just let people know if they're interested who to call. And we figured this would be the easiest way. Uh, we have other plans, but this is our first one that we wanted to try. And it's a joint effort with both platoons in the company. Okay. Uh, one of your vehicles, you have vehicles, obviously? Yes. Do you go to summer camp, or is that the reserves that do that? No, we do also. You do also. Is it at a different time? Uh, it changes every year. Uh, that's something that's put out by the commanders. You know, uh, we just get the schedule. We have a yearly schedule and we know pretty much where we're going. It's always subject to change. But um, this year we'll be going to Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. Uh, originally it was going to be Honduras, but by matters... Honduras? Yes. By how matters long? above our control, we aren't going now. How long is that uh, for? How long do you go to camp for? For two weeks. You go... Far like that, you're going to Indiana. Where have you been in the past? We're, no, we're going to Fort Indian Town Gap, which is in Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's Indian, not Indiana. Uh, where did you go last year for, for camp? Fort Drum. Fort Drum, all right. And uh, being National Guard, we usually stay within the state. But uh, it was more or less a reward or 
I guess you would call it that, to be in Honduras during the summertime. I don't know if that's a reward or not, but okay. it was a reward to be chosen to go there. Until uh, uh, we're going to be talking to different people, until we can get a, a, a breakdown of just the whole thing, I'm a little con confused as to what I'm asking you. So I was going to ask you if it's national, if it's state, but I guess it's a combination of both. You're under yes. some state control. Right. The governor can call you out for emergencies and exactly. so forth. Exactly. And that's uh, one of the main differences between the National Guard and Reserves. Uh, Sergeant Dixon can go over that okay, more we'll, later we'll on. Okay, we'll get into that with sure. him. All right. While we're here, what, should we do this later or should we do this now? Uh, if you'd like to do it now, we can have... Okay, let's talk to someone else about the uh, the vehicle. And this is Sergeant Dixon? Yes. Hi, I'm Bob Venn, Sergeant Dixon. Yes, we haven't met before. How long have you been uh, in the National Guard? Five years in October. You from Plattsburgh? I'm from Moores. Moores? Yep. Well, welcome. Uh, I thought that, 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 that looks like a name from uh, Beekman Town. I'm just some Dixon, the Nixon, the Dixon, Nixon. Who Nixon, played basketball? Nixon. 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 All right. With a D. Huh? Like that. I like that. Okay. You have a full time job also? Yes. I work in Montgomery Wards. Well, that's the difference right here. That's yes. a big difference for you. You yeah. do this for the uh, a change of pace or? No, it's basically uh, I joined. Five years ago, there was a lot of benefits in, uh, with the National Guard. Such as? Such as a lot of educational benefits, uh, retirement. It's a part-time job. You make a lot of money for just coming two days, and uh, you're two weeks a year. And you come two days every week? No, two days a month, two weeks a year. Okay. All right. So sometimes do you have a choice of when, when you want to make those two days? No, no, no. It's a yearly calendar that uh, our battalion sends down to us, and that's when we'll uh, train every year. Oh, that's for the two weeks. But what about the two days a month? Can you? No, we all meet together at one time. Oh, it's, it's they all at one time. It isn't a, you're one time and someone else another. No, no. Is there anybody here that's full time? Yes. There's. Uh, we have a training NCO, a unit administrator, a recruiting a recruiter, or a maintainer, strength maintainer, what they're calling them. The uh, and we have a facilities person and a supply sergeant. They're, oh, they're all here. Yeah, they're, they stay here five days a week. And they're here on the real weekends, too. Are they transferred from one place to another, like from this, this station to one in Buffalo, to one no. in Indiana, or anything like no. that? No, it's active guard and reserve. Okay. They're on active duty status here. Can you transfer if you want to? Now, for instance, sure, sure. If there's a slot vacant somewhere, you can put in for uh, transfer to there, and you have to be, go to a selection board and everything like that. Okay. But uh, when the opportunity arises, they can, they can do that. Is this something that people would... would uh, Take as a career? Uh, oh, sure. You, sure. you th decide you want to work with the National Guard uh, full time? Yeah, if there's a slot open and you, and you get that slot and you want to continue on with your career within the state or other states. Are there fine. any openings for things like that? Not usually. Not usually. There's a, a variety of different MOSs or job skills. Depending on which one you hold, you can go to uh, other job skills in different parts of the state. You know, military and customs people and everything always talk in initials. You just said MOS. Yes. Can you tell me what MOS means? Well, it's a military occupational okay. specialty. All right. That's what you mean by that. What can you tell us about uh, this, this our, vehicle? This is our Humvee. Uh, the what? The Humvee. Humvee. The same one you're seeing advertised for the civilians, but this is a little more beefed up for the military. And uh, this is basically what we're using now as a troop transport, as uh, medical uh, transport, command vehicles, things like that. We can also mount weapons on the top. Our scout platoons uh, use them a lot, stuff like that. And it's a multi-purpose vehicle. But they're made differently? Or yes. You, would, you can't use this as an ambulance. You can't use... Right. This is basically a, a troop transport or cargo transport, like a pickup style okay. with a cover on the back. Yep. But also they'll come such as this, where you can mount a... Uh, tow missile on the top or a dragon and you can carry troops as a four-door you can carry troops in the back and it's dependent on the, like I said the, the MOS again depending on what you're doing it uh, can be used for anything basically and uh, what we use them for here we don't have any of these because we're not a, a scouts or anything but we have this which is a pickup style for troop transport car cargo we have an ambulance which comes with uh, its own filtration system it comes with everything uh, our medics would need. How many vehicles do you have? Right now we have, what, three? Three of the Humvees? Three of the Humvees. Two huh? Humvees. Is, is, this it, is this a recent innovation? How old are, is the Humvee? They've got to be about since the beginning of, before Desert Storm. Okay. So they've been around for a little while. Is this while. an antenna? Yep. That's where you mount your communications. 
It'll hook on right here. See the wires coming in here? And, and then it'll all go, feeds to the front where you can control your, op your uh, radio. Okay. There's nothing dainty about it, I'll tell you that. And it's not, it, it's not upholstered very well inside either. No. No, no it's, uh, it's pretty comfortable, <laughs> it's though. It's very it? basic, huh? It's got four-wheel independent suspension. That okay. way you can go through just about anything. Okay, we'll get an idea here. Of course, the colors are, are the camouflage colors. And they can, depending on the, the climate, they can, like in Desert Storm, I'm sure people have seen them with the desert camouflage. Uh-huh. Now, did, was the National Guard were called to Desert Storm? Some were, yes. But they weren't the infantry troops. They were the support personnel. MPs, uh, medical, supply, things like that. Okay. Uh, there's your seats inside. Uh, in this case, for personnel. Right. Very basic model right here. It has nothing special about it, just that it's a, a very convenient vehicle. You can go anywhere with it. Not very uh, bullet resistant, I'll say that for it. No, uh, not this model. That's huh? not, what it, not this model. But one of those that you have with the right. gun, would, would it be all metal clad? Well, it's just like this here. Okay. Just like the Kevlar coating that right. we have on the sides. It's a whole shield, which is bulletproof to a point. You know, you, of course, you get hit with a rocket. It's not... Uh, Completely, but small arms fire you can uh, be protected from. Okay. Now, I should have asked you before, but how many people do you have at this uh, reserve? Uh, we call it the post, a station, what do you call it? Well, it's a company. Company. It's, we're a company minus here, and our detachment is in Saranac Lake, okay, which is a platoon. So this would be like headquarters to Saranac Lake? Is that what you're saying? No, we have a headquarters platoon. Here? Okay. Right, with two other infantry platoons. Line platoons. All right. And we have another one in Saranac Lake, another line platoon. Okay. And we ha also have our anti armor section down there and our mortars. Would this reserve station here, or unit, be the same, say, as one in uh, Syracuse or Cobleskill? Or do you each, uh, like, are you more communication? Someone else is more medical? Someone else? Right. Well, like, our battalion is divided up into sections. We have companies that are infantry. We have companies, a headquarters company. We have a mortar or artillery and stuff like that. We are more of an infantry company here. That, well, someone else might be more communications. Right. And we more... all come together as a group to be a, a complete fighting force. All right. So that you are one of four or five that would be a group, like maybe the other right. one's in Cobleskill or some other place, right. Malone. Right. We have uh, three, what is it, three companies in the battalion? Do you know where they are? Where are they? Malone? No. No? No, there. Yeah, he can, he can tell okay. you all about that. Okay, very good. That's, uh, they're all downstate. Okay. All right, this is one of the vehicles, an MV. What does that stand for? It's a Humvee. Humvee. It's a high-mobility, multi-wheel multi vehicle. Okay. And someone mentioned before that uh, this vehicle has been maybe in my, right up to the top of the... Oh, yeah, huh? yeah. As far as right up to the, the doors. Right up to the doors here. All kinds oh, yeah. of power. Yep. Can't stop them. All right. Any special thing you need to be able to drive this? You, you're uh, qualified to drive them through the military with a, from our uh, motor sergeant. Oh, so you have to be qualified oh, to yeah. drive this? You have oh. to have a, a Humvee license, which is uh, you get through the motor sergeant, like I said. Okay. For every vehicle, you have to have a license for to drive. Okay. Well, we have here, this is a trailer to carry equipment? Yeah, that's a basic trailer that we use for, like, usually our, our uh, mess section will we'll tow that, but it can carry cargo, anything like that. This is what looks to me like one of the most interesting in the whole building right yep. there. That's the one I like. That's our MKT. That's your MKT. that has got to be kitchen uh, somewhere in there. Is that all right? Military kitchen? Mobile kitchen tent. Mobile kitchen tent. Okay. Got to have one of those. Yeah, we bring those to the field, and we can cook right out of them, uh, everything. Okay. We're in a large area here. It, uh, and you got a big door to bring the vehicles. This isn't yeah. a garage for your vehicles. No, no. this is uh, what we call our drill hall or our drill shed, which is for anything we have to do as a company together indoors. Okay, so you have your training. Do you, do you have PT training or anything like that? Oh, sure. We have, uh, like a, in fact, we have a PT test this weekend coming up. We'll do our push-ups and sit-ups in here. Then we'll do a two-mile run outside. And in here we'll do, uh, we have... Uh, a Christmas party every year for the families of the National Guard. We have it here. Our first formations are here. All of our formations are here. Inspections, things like that. It's enough room for a whole company to get in here and uh, stay indoors when the weather's not very good. Okay. Like today. Yeah. We've got, what, six, six inches of snow out here and uh, 
Yep. Uh, it's not the best day to be out in the route. Very slippery. But no matter what the weather is, if we've got training to do outside, I don't care what the weather is, we're going to be outside. You go outside. Yep. Well, I guess you have wars or uh, military or any of the other things. The emergencies right. don't stop because of the weather. That's right. And that's the fact, way we train. A lot of the emergencies you would have in the state would be because of the weather. Right. Right. Like uh, we had Grand Polar last year, which in March, when we had that uh, snowfall, we were activated for that day to go out and uh, assist the civil authorities and, and stuff like that to uh, transport people to and from the hospital, to shovel people out. Okay, like so that. this was, it, uh, it was an emergency of a different kind. Oh, right. I didn't realize you did that. Right. We, uh, a lot of people don't really don't because uh, we were down here and a lot of people were calling in and uh, some of the senior citizens and uh, disabled people like that that needed to be shoveled out and everything, we went down and shoveled them out. A lot of our troops transported people from the hospital to their homes, things like that. And uh, it assisted the community, community a lot, I believe. This didn't make the, the news or the paper a lot, did it? Uh, part of it did. Uh, we didn't have a lot of... Uh, you know, I think maybe you should, you know, because yeah. we, we think you're trading for the next war. Right. So that's what I think. Right. We're, we're doing that, and also on the state side, we're, uh, we're helping out around the community. An awful lot more emergencies occur like that than going to, uh, you know, to a war or something right, else, right. obviously. Yeah, and uh, uh, like we do a lot of civil disturbance training, which is with... Uh, our bulletproof vests and the, the shields and the batons and everything like that. If there's any rioting or anything like that, we we handle that also in the state. I guess I'll ask your other person uh, for the recruiter. It's, there's no limit to the number you could have in the reserve here? Oh, yeah. We have a, uh, a maximum strength that we can attain, and that's we have to stay at that. Okay. But uh, we can't just continue to recruit people and have a... You know, there's a, a certain number for a company, and that's, that's what we can uh, okay, recruit. Okay, that's to. all you can have. Yeah. All right. All right, then we'll take a short break for... Calvin in his shoulder, and we're at the National, National, Guard, Guard, National Guard Armory in Plattsburgh, New York, which is located just west of the entrance uh, to the county fair. You've got to go into the entrance to the county fair and take a right. This morning it was hard to find it. We're in Morrisonville. <laughs> we're in Morrisonville. Did I say Plattsburgh again? Uh, we're in Morrisonville. That's where we are, but don't look for the post office. It's a few miles west of here. Yep. Thanks much for watching Hometown Cable. We're in Champlain and Rouses Point and all other points north. What you're watching is a family affair. We've talked to uh, young Don Dixon. Uh, it's Jess. Jess Dixon. And now we're going to talk to Don Dixon, and you are his father. Yes. All right, so what is your title here, Don? I'm what's known as, it's a new title in the state. I'm a maintainer. It's my, what you might think of as a uh, recruiter retention NCO all rolled into one. The concept in the, the Army National Guard today has changed more toward keeping people with this unit, uh, keeping happy soldiers. If I, as a recruiter, recruit a young man and tell him he's going to get such and such a benefit, I make certain through his career that he gets everything he's supposed to from the National Guard because we ask some pretty tough things of these young fellows and we want to make sure that they get their end of the, the bargain. Now, you see, you mentioned Army National Guard. That's the first time I've used that word. With the are there different National Guards? Yes, there are. There's the Army National Guard and there's the Air National Guard. Uh, the term National Guard is, uh, comes from many, many years ago when the United States just had militia forces. Uh, we're with the oldest service in the United States, uh, and we are the state militia. And through the years, we've developed into the... Uh, part of the Army. This is the United States Army, as it says right here on my uniform. Uh, but we're available to the governor of the state of New York in times of state emergencies. Now, the federal government takes priority because we are the United States Army, but we're also available as a state militia. Are you a, uh, you're also a state militia by name? No, we're no. the, the Army National Guard. Right. Are you called the New York Army National Guard. Okay. okay, so it's the New York Army National Guard. Right, and then there's the Vermont Army National Guard, the Pennsylvania National but Guard. But that's strictly for location, because you're all in the same unit. Exactly. We're all Basically, the United, all States, United Army, States Army, stationed okay. in different states right. across the United States. Tell us a little bit about uh, Don Dixon. Where are you from originally? And oh, I'm from parts... Uh, <laughs> I'm actually from Dayton, Ohio, originally. I was born and raised in Dayton. Uh, I joined the submarine service in the mid-60s, uh, served six years in the submarine service. When I got out, a friend of mine asked me up in the North Country for a vacation. I liked it so much up here, I stayed. I've been here for uh, since 1972. And uh, I've done a few things. I've farmed. I've been the uh, 
dog control officer around the Champlain area. A lot of people know me. Uh, and then I came back in the Army National Guard as a part-time soldier in 1987. Uh, it's, this is a very good unit, a very close-knit unit, hard-working uh, fellas. Uh, I like the concept of having a, a local uh, military force and a local force that can help out in times of emergencies around this local area. Uh, the recruiting job came open. I'm, I'm full-time active Army National Guard along with a few other fellows like Jess explained before here and uh, that's what I've done since then. Are you uh, under a military pension as, as, a, as a, a recruiter? Yes, I'm the, uh, well, I'm, I'm being paid full-time okay. by the United States. But Army are you right in now. for so many years? I sign up generally for a five-year enlistment. Uh, then at the end of that five years, then of course I've got the, I'm eligible to re-enlist. Uh, and it's 20 years just like uh, any other military service would be. Uh -huh. You know, I was thinking you came here from Dayton, uh, at least in the northern tier. Most people went from our northern tier to Dayton <laughs> when, when uh, Harris closed. Yeah, you know, yeah, you're, the, yeah. you're the exception. Funny there. coincidence. Uh, yeah. It's just a coincidence, huh? And how long have you been doing this since 86? I've, I started as a recruiter here in uh, 1988, and then when the concept changed over to recruiter retention NCO, I stayed on. and. Uh, it's uh, something that the AGR system, AGR being Active Garden Reserve, uh, is something that is pretty much hometown, is a hometown idea. We don't have to move. You, I know you were questioning before. We don't have to be transferred to any other part of the state or any other part of the United States. As a recruiter, you right. don't I have to. I can stay right here. Uh, now, if I decide I want to be a retention NCO strictly or a training NCO, I can ask for transfer. But uh, generally, we stay right here in the same area. Okay. I guess uh, the confusion, I think my wife asked me, where are you going? And I said, we're either going to the National Guard or the Reserve. I'm not sure which or if they're the same. What is the difference between the uh, Reserve, Army Reserve, and the Army National Guard? I'm glad you asked that because a lot of people get confused. We're both part of the United States Army. Uh, it's called the, the, the whole army concept. Uh, there's the active duty army, there's the army reserve, and then there's the Army National Guard. Uh, the Army National Guard is part of the United States Army, uh, except that the two, the differences, we're available to the governor of the state of New York during times of emergency. The Army Reserve is not. They're uh, just part of the army. The other difference that if you've been watching the, the national news and the, the way things, the way trends are going now, the bottom up uh, change in the army, we, the concept of uh, infantry and support are changing. The Army National Guard handles most of the combat arms or infantry type duties where the Army Reserve is changing over to mostly support types of duties. Now by that I mean field hospitals, uh, ammunition like the 962nd Ordnance Company on the other side of town. They support the combat troops, but the combat role is changing over to the Army National Guard, and that's, that's what we are. Nationwide, this is hard maybe to answer, are there more people in the National Guard, Army National Guard, or Army Reserve? It's about equal. Uh, our strengths are, are staying about equal. The, the okay. reserve forces, which would be the Army Reserve and the National Guard together, uh, are about 50-50. Okay. Uh, we've been hearing, uh, at least I've been hearing, about uh, at colleges. There's the, is it the National Guard or is it the Reserve that have units at the different colleges where they train and so forth? The ROTC program is administered mostly by the Army Reserve or most, okay. mostly by the uh, United States Army, the Army ROTC. Okay. So that wouldn't be us. And is it you know, Now the recent uh, statement in the papers that the colleges in the state of New York can no longer have a unit at the college because of uh, uh, gays and so forth, been some, uh, can't, they aren't freely entered into the army. Uh, that's the reserves we're talking about? Well, actually the protest uh, by the people in the state university system is against all military forces. The, the Navy can't recruit in there, the Army can't recruit the Marine Corps. So it's no one is allowed to go in there and have recruiting okay. events. And we did, uh, we did go down there and offer uh, these these folks, uh, the financial aids and the financial benefits that we've got for joining the Army Reserve or the National Guard, but uh, we're not allowed to do that any longer. Okay. Uh, 
it's signed right there. It says Army National Guard recruiter. Do you do your recruiting from this desk? Do you appear in the post office, anywhere else in the community you I'm, go? Uh, I'm, I deal in a lot of cases with the state university system uh, and Clinton Community College. We find that uh, up until just April 1st, we were allowed to offer substantial uh, money to go to college or to pay for your college career. And still, right now, we offer uh, the new Montgomery GI Bill, is what it's called, which pays people approximately $190 a month over and above their drill pay, which is about $100 to start. So you're talking about $290 a month for working two days a month. Okay. There's not many part-time jobs that can, that can uh, compete with this. But then again, we're looking for those types of individuals who are uh, college-oriented. In other words, you've got to have a high school diploma to join the Army National Guard nowadays. Uh, so any of uh, you young folks that are thinking about dropping out of high school and joining the Army National Guard, it's not done anymore. Without a high school diploma, you can't get in any service. So if you stay in high school and you're headed for college, uh, we're the place to look. All right, we'll take a short break and come back. When we come back, we're going to talk about why should I, or why should I have years ago, or why should you uh, join the Army National Guard? What are the advantages? What are some of the things it's going to give you other than this money he talked about? And we'll get in about how much it pays you uh, a little later. Because someone mentioned before, it's a good way of making some part-time money. It's some good part-time money. Is that correct? It certainly is. We're talking with Don Dixon. He's the Army National Guard uh, recruiter and main... Maintainer. Maintainer. What does maintainer mean? Uh, maintainer is a strength maintainer. I maintain the strength of this company in this locale. And if you don't recruit, you go out and you grab them, you bring them in? Is that right, the way you maintain right. it? Well, I, I, I get a few of them that way, but usually it's volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Thanks for watching. Sergeant Dixon, I just talked to a Sergeant Dixon. I talked to a Sergeant Dixon, too. Who's the, who's the commanding officer out of the two of you? Who's in, higher up? Are you higher up than he I, is? I am a staff sergeant, and he's a sergeant. I'm E6, he's E5. As a, as a father, you're boss anyway, I'm right? always the boss. Forever. Forever, whether he outranks me or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are the advantages of, uh, what would you say to young people out there? First of all, how old do you have to be? Uh, we're allowed to enlist people from the age of 17 to 35. Uh, 17, you have to have your parents' consent. And you've got to be a, at least a high school graduate. Well, actually, we can enlist people who are planning to be high school graduates. Uh, usually, most people at 17 years old are generally a junior in high school. Uh, we can enlist them at that point. They have to promise in writing that they're going to complete high school. If, uh, say, hypothetically, we enlist somebody at 17 years old, uh, they go to basic training during the summer, they come back and they start their senior year and they d decide to drop out. Well, if you drop out of high school, you also drop out of the Army National Guard because we'll dis discharge them at that point. So they've got to complete high school along with doing their basic training in, during the summer session. They go back, finish their senior year, they drill with us, pick up some valuable part-time money, and then when they graduate, they finish five weeks of advanced individual training in Fort Benning, Georgia, and that's all the active duty they have to do, and they do two days a month with them, two weeks a year with us. It's safe to say a lot of people are joining the National Guard not just for money, but because of they believe in the, the program, they want to help in emergencies and so forth. Exactly. That's uh, one of the advantages of being a local force. All right. And how wide of an area would be uh, located here as this, their, I don't want to say headquarters, as this would be their reserve building, how wide of an area would, would come here? There are units all over uh, New York State. Uh, we are part of the third of the 108th. Infantry Battalion, which is headquartered in Utica. We're just one company. There are actually four companies, a headquarters and three rifle companies. Uh, we cover Clinton County generally. Uh, if somebody in Clinton County joins the Army National Guard, they're generally, they generally drill here. There's also a unit in Ticonderoga. There's also a unit in Saranac Lake. Uh, that they that covered those locales and one in Malone. Okay, you don't have to refer to a paper, I'm sure. What are the advantages, some of the advantages? Now, let's do them all at one time here. Number one, uh, it's a chance to serve the state and the federal government uh, because they need help. Right. That's one advantage. Right. Then what are the other advantages? The advantages to, uh, p to young folks, of course, are uh, the GI Bill, which pays you $190 a month, as I explained. Okay, $190 a month for two days a month. Right. Well, that's over and above your drill pay, which is about $100 a month. 
So you're making 290 for working two days. What's the drill pay? Drill pay is uh, you get paid on a, they call it a UTA or a unit training assembly. You get paid one day's pay for one unit training assembly. On a drill weekend we have, if it's a Saturday and a Sunday, we have four UTAs, four unit training assemblies. Two for Saturday, two for Sunday. So you get paid four uh, UTAs, which is about $50 per UTA for people beginning. So you're talking about uh, about $100. I'm sorry, it was about, about 25 per UTA, so okay. about $100 for a drill weekend starting out. And, and then over two days a month, you're going to get a rough, nearly $300. Right, if you're going to full-time college, and we consider 12 semester hours full-time. All right. Do you get any uh, medical any medical? Uh, n while you're on drill, you're covered totally. When you're on drill, right? But not you can't you can't subscribe to a, uh, a health plan while you're no. here. Okay. But we do offer uh, SGLI insurance, the regular government uh, life insurance that covers you 365 days a year, whether you're here or not. That costs you about sixteen dollars a drill, and you're covered for two hundred thousand dollars. So it's pretty cheap life insurance. Just during that time you're here, or does no, it cover you all the time? No, 365 days. Okay. Uh, what about college? Do you help them go to college? You mentioned uh, April 1st they've cut something back. We lost our uh, bonus money. Uh, we were allowed to give an enlistment bonus and the student loan repayment program which pay, repaid student loans up to about $10,000. We lost that due to budgetary constraints. Uh, we hope to get that back in the future. Uh, but we do, our major goal for these young fellows is to, and we try to persuade them, we actively talk to them and try to persuade them to go to college, because in today's uh, career outlook, without a college degree, you're going to be looking long and hard to find a job. So we encourage these young folks to go to college and use the money that we offer them, because we're asking them to do some pretty hard things on a drill weekend, and we want to see them get some benefit out of it. Is there any kind of an incentive that if it's used for college rather than regular spending, that they get any bonus because of that? No. no. There is some encouragement. Uh, we've got the OCS program, which you can become an officer, federally recognized and state recognized. If uh, you complete college, and we, we pay you the money while you're completing college, once you've completed college and you get all the money you can as an enlisted person, then you go to our state OCS program and become a officer, which if you're going to do 20 years with us, that's another thing about the Army National Guard. If you do 20 years, you, there's a retirement. There's not many part-time jobs that offer a retirement. Do they offer it to you when you retire or do you have to wait till you're 60 or 60? When you're age 60. When you're age 60, all right. The, uh, did you have an advance notice that they were going to cut out this bonus of signing? And no, so it was a pretty sudden thing. Uh, so that uh, anybody that was going to join should have joined <laughs> the last <laughs> month, uh, correct? Right. But uh, like I say, we've still got the, uh, the GI Bill. And we still get the other benefits. You're allowed to use the commissary on base. Oh, you do have those benefits. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you're allowed to use the exchange, uh, any of the facilities. At least for a base. short time. Hopefully, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Maybe we can keep some of it. You, you think there might? It's hard. Possibility. To <laughs> You'd have to be a magician. Yeah, they've been talking. About, I've been seeing the paper about the hospital. They like to have some yeah. kind of medical yeah. facilities we for all the retired. We have a lot of retired folks around here. Certainly do. Which brings up another point. Anybody that who has prior service. Uh, say uh, people went to and served three years in the Army, if they've got prior service, they can also enlist in the Army National Guard and uh, continue your service, and that adds right on to, say you've got three years, uh, you've got 17 to do before you get an extra retirement. And it never hurts to have an extra retirement. But you've got to be, be before you're 35 years before of age. Before you're 35. Well, actually, if you get, we add on the number of years that you served. So, you know, you can have served six years and be uh, 41. And, and join the Army National Guard. Okay. All right. Anything else you can think of that as far as uh, what you would tell a young man or woman? Any women? We are allowed to enlist uh, some females in peripheral MOSs. By that, I mean uh, jobs that we have that, that go along with the infantry job. We're not allowed to enlist women in the infantry because of the probability of combat. Now, that's... You know, there's a lot of controversy about that, and I really don't get involved in it because I don't have any influence. You have any women at all in the unit now? We had, uh, my daughter used to be in the unit. She was, was an admin specialist. Uh, we've had females uh, as cooks. Uh, we can have females in the medical profession uh, that would like to be medics or something like that. But uh, 
according to Congress, were not allowed to enlist them in combat. Right? So they would be more likely to go into the reserves, more, generally, right, because of the specialization that right. they have units. You were somebody right. they're more in to me? support, and they wouldn't be on the supports. Front all right, all right. So that do you get out with all these people on the weekend, or are you? I'm here five days a week, and I also go to drill with them. I also attend their two week annual training. And uh, that's how I make sure that uh, the fellows that I tell that they're going to get something, they get what they got coming because I talk to them constantly. Okay. So that every, uh, all your regular training is on weekends. Right. Persons that you generally are not working weekends, right. so they come here and put in their two days. Now, at one time, that would keep you out of the Army, out of the Navy? You didn't have to join the service? That's right. At one well, time. This is, this is the service. It still does. All right. Uh, but it still does that. Right. Do they ever call someone from here and say, now you've got to join? Is there any advantage to join once you've been in here? Uh, we have a lot of uh, fellas that they join us. They'll go to basic training, and then they'll go to advanced individual training, go right through the, the whole procedure. They decide that uh, once they've completed that, that this is something they'd like to try for a career. Now, at that point, you have to go to basic training. You have to go to advanced individual training, which is 13 weeks long total. And then you have to spend a year with us, and then we'll release you to an active service if, if that's where you want to go. And a lot of young fellows around here that don't have a college degree or are looking for a job see that as an option. And uh, we've had them go for like three years in the active service and then come back, and uh, they're, they're still a real, real good soldier. So that you, do you have any, uh, I'm using the wrong word here because I already nearly did there, you said this is part of the, the service. Do you have any vet, uh, veterans from the military, active military, yes, in your unit? Yes, we have quite a few. In fact, I'm one. I'm You're, uh, okay. I joined the submarine service in six. Is there an advantage for you to be part of the National Guard rather than the Reserve, is that? No, no. It's just a continuation of your military career. And once you got 20 in, 20 is 20. Okay. We, we talked off camera a little bit. Once in a while, the state's going to call you in for, like uh, I think your son mentioned last year, they were called in because of the uh, bringing people to the hospital, et cetera. Right. Uh, do you are you paid for that time off? Yes, we're uh, what's it's called activation. Uh, if a local state of emergency is called, uh, the local people around here call the governor of the state of New York and ask him if he would uh, activate the New York Army National Guard to aid in this situation. And uh, usually uh, the governor goes right along because he, the people on the ground here are, understand the situation, and he'll activate us for a certain period of time. And uh, we're paid, if it's activated by the state, we're paid by the state. If we're activated by the federal government, we're paid out of federal funds. Right. At that time, I, as a member, can't decide whether I'm going to become active or not. I'm automatically activated. Right, you're activated. I'm, I'm, at, I'm coming right. here. You're in the United States. And you can send me to a different part of the state, even, That's if right. I need it, like a flood or whatever. The world. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks. All right. Now, the next question is, what about my employer? He says, Bob, I don't want you to go. I didn't tell you to join the National Guard. I'm paying you for five days a week. If you're gone for a week, I'm going to dock your pay. Right. There are several state and federal laws that cover that, and it's called Veterans Reemployment Rights. Uh, if the National Guard, and we've, we've had real good luck with employers. Employers are so cooperative, it's unbelievable. Uh, because they understand the value of having a, uh, a well-trained military force available. But uh, if you're activated and the war lasts for uh, three years. You have rights to go right back to that same job with your seniority added up, uh, with your raises all intact. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking about just a week though. Where One I'm week, gonna same thing. And I draw my regular pay generally with no, him? No, you won't. He doesn't have to pay doesn't you. He has to. to give you time off. Okay, he and, could uh, pay me if he wants. He Many times they do. A lot, of, a lot of employers pay military people while they're on reserve duty because they see the value of, of okay. having that available. You're not called up very often for state no, no, uh, emergencies, often. right? No. But if, it, if you're there, if needed. We're there if needed. Okay. Anything else we should cover while we're in here? That we'll go out and see some of your other uh, activations. I see, of course, all the Army gear, the Army uh, colors. Do you wear these normally when you're on active duty here? Yes. I this guess is, I'd call this it. This is my duty uniform. That's your duty. What about the people when they come in for their two days? They're immediately Same thing. This is called a battle dress uniform, and uh, this is our work clothes. Do they have to buy these? No, these are issued to you. Though everything you see here is issued to you. Okay. Uh, Calvin, you got any questions while I'm here? Well, let's talk more about the, the new army here, where these guys might be heading off. We saw in Desert Storm that 
You know, these guys, people like this get called. Yeah, that's right. Just recently, you know, people were called to go to Desert Storm, and they say, I don't want to go to Desert Storm. Uh, I mean, that's what they joined for. It's what they were being paid for. It's for emergencies. Right. Uh, I don't uh, beat around the bush when I enlist people. I make it perfectly clear to them that this is, is the United States Army, and we're available in times of emergencies, and that's the premise we deal from. If you're going to join a reserve force, uh, we're going to train real hard, because we are ready, and even more so nowadays, to go if we're called into combat, and uh, we want to make sure that these young folks are trained real well, so we bring them all back. So that's the basis for how I how I recruit people into the Army National Guard, that they have the understanding that in times of emergencies, we're going to be called. Now, we'll be called, we won't be called individually, if uh, we're, up till this point, we've been called a roundup brigade. The 27th Brigade in the state of New York is a brigade we belong to. Now in that brigade there are three battalions. The 3rd of the 108th, the 2nd of the 108th, and the 1st of the 105th. And in the battalion there are four companies, a headquarters, company A, B, and C in each battalion. We are company B of the 3rd of the 108th, which is part of the 27th Brigade, which is available to the 10th Mountain Division. There's not one person out there that knows what you just said. That <laughs> it's, is, it's including it's me. Of, it's kind of a tough concept, <laughs> but it's, it's a, it's a what hierarchy. You, what you're talking about is how you've come down from one big unit right. into the smaller ones as you're going. And the point, the point of that, the point I wanted to make was, if the 10th Mountain Division is called up, then the 27th Brigade will be called up, will be called up as part of the 27th Brigade. Did anyone from here go to Desert Storm? No, because uh, the 10th Mountain Division didn't go to Desert okay. Storm, so we, of course, wouldn't be called up. There were no mountains in Desert Storm that you could well, go to. Well, now, the, the, <laughs> the mountain might be a little deceiving, 10th Mountain Division. It's more of a nostalgic type thing than anything, because we can go anywhere in the world. We don't have to go to uh, mm -hmm. any kind of mountain. But storm. the reserves were called up at that point. The reserves right? were Re called up and sent to Germany uh, in support of Desert okay, Storm. Okay, they were loading, unloading, moving right. munitions and things, right. right? They weren't sent to the if you quote-unquote firing or fighting exactly. war. It, we were, didn't, were a uh, actually, we were pretty close to being activated, but when uh, the actual shooting started, they found out that it was it was easier than they had, had figured it would be because of the uh, the air, uh -huh. and uh, so we weren't called up. Okay. Have you, uh, was there any National Guard called up? Yes, there was some uh, military units, or military police units called up, uh, there were some engineers called up, and I believe there were some medical units called up in the state. Okay. So anybody in this area joining the Army National Guard has to belong to this Army National Guard. You can't right. can't go down to where there's the we military don't like police. We to try to make people uh, travel for more than 50 miles to go to a drill weekend because, for one mm -hmm. thing, it's it's dangerous. Uh, so if you look outside today, yes. it'd be tough to travel someplace. But it's usually within a 50 mile radius. They don't stay overnight. They go home and come back the next day. No, no. We're generally in the field on every drill weekend. We'll uh, come in Saturday morning, uh, grab our gear draw weapons, and go to the field. And you're sleeping out in the field? Oh, yeah. Somewhere in the Adirondacks, somewhere in the Green Mountains, uh, some local training areas. Okay. I'm sure some local citizens have seen us training. Okay. All right, now let's go out and see what... You've got some big boots on here. Is that, <laughs> is that regular gear? These are called chips or Chippewas. They're a uh, ski mountain boot, and uh, they're, like they're very good to break in. But yeah. they're, once you got them broke in, they're a great boot. They're warm, they're insulated and uh, they'll fit on military skis. Okay. We'll be back. Thanks for watching Hometown Cable. You're watching uh, this Sunday show, What's Going On Here? And we're talking to Don Dixon, the recruiter and maintainer at the uh, Army National Guard uh, in Morrisonville, New York. As we were leaving the office where we were talking with uh, Sergeant D Dixon, I realized that I hadn't really got much information on how you people out there who might want to contact him can do that. Again, I'm not advocating, we're not here to promote the National Guard, we're here to let you know that it is available. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, and I'm not saying you are saying you should or shouldn't. Is that correct? Exactly. You're not trying to sell the National Guard, no. but you're making, letting know that it's here. Exactly. We're looking for, uh, and I, I, to coin a phrase, a uh, few good men. Uh, we're lucky in that we don't have to have a lot of people. Uh, and I don't try to talk anyone into the Army National Guard. Uh, 
I know recruiters have a bad rap that uh, they talked me into this and they made me do this and that. I don't want to talk anybody into it. I believe that this is a very good, uh, a good idea to see Army National Guard, especially for young folks going to college. Uh, but I'll explain to you exactly what you've got available, uh, what we can give you, what, we're, what is required from you, and uh, then you make an intelligent, informed decision. I don't talk you into it, and I won't con continue to call you on the telephone and harass you. I talked to you one time. If you want me to call you back, I'll be glad to. But uh, you can contact me by calling 563-6184 uh, five days a week. Uh, you can call me in Moore's at home. I'm writing the book. Uh, we've got several brochures that explain. Now, some of them, I'll be perfectly honest with you, are uh, sales brochures. Some of them want to make it sound uh, a little more than it is. But uh, intelligent people who read these things can figure out exactly uh, what you're going to get from the Army National Guard, and I'll be glad to tell you what is going to be required of you in the Army National Guard. How do you find it, find it listed in the phone book, if you forget the number? Under New York State, generally. Oh, not under federal. Right. So uh, this is what is confusing me, Don. We talked also about the building. Mm -hmm. Who owns the building? This is a, this is a state armory. It's owned by New York State. Right. Owned by New York State. We're talking U.S. Army Reserve. Uh, I'm sorry, U.S. Army National Guard, but right. we're talking a building owned by the state, right. but was contributed to by the county, right. the federal, and the state, you right. told us. The uh, county and the, uh, the town of Plattsburgh understand the need to have a local military force or local <coughs> militia that's available in times of emergencies and things like that. I, I believe, I'm not really certain, but I believe the land was donated by the county. Uh, there were some funds from the town of Plattsburgh and, and things like that. So it was, a, it was a cooperative type thing to wind up with a nice state armory here that's available for uh, meetings, uh, available for they can rent this building to do just about anything in it. It's what? available to anybody in the community. Oh, wait a minute now, wait a minute. What do you mean? Uh, they, they'd have to rent the building if they wanted it? To, right. To have a like, a, say, a club wants to rent the building to hold an auction or okay. whatever. They can talk with the people here at the uh, on the state side, and they can come up with uh, what the rental rates are. And anybody in the community who has a club or uh, some kind of function that they'd like to use this building for, it's available for that. You said so, on the state side. Yeah, there are there are state people who that work, work here. here Is the, that right? To maintain the building, and uh, there's uh -huh. a supervisor that covers this armory, the Malone Armory, the Saranac Armory, and the Ticonderoga Armory. Okay. The, are these available anywhere else in the in the county? Other these than you'll find uh, most of the high school students can uh, get any of these brochures in their guidance offices. We supply the guidance offices with uh, most of these brochures, especially the ones that cover college benefits. Okay. Are they in the, are they in the post offices at all? Uh, generally in the post offices. Okay. You ever go to schools and talk to people? I students? generally do, but I'm not the kind of person that uh, young fellows in high school will walk up to and talk to. I no? don't know what it is about me. But your son was <laughs> telling me. He said, you're tough. <laughs> something, <laughs> something about the He looks didn't say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, we have uh, young fellows here, and what I do is I say, you know, if your friends are interested in this, talk to your friends about it, explain to them what you know about it and what you think of the Army National Guard. And uh, generally we get uh, quite a few people, because the, the young fellows here, by virtue of having a strength maintenance system, are real satisfied with the deal they got. So is this what keeps you nice and trim like this? And, uh, <laughs> no, I have to keep nice and trim. I get a PT test twice a year. Uh, I'm 46 years old and I'm in better shape now than I was when I was 35. So great. If yeah. uh, prior service guys are looking to get back in shape, this is the place to come. <laughs> okay. You mentioned before that you're not trying to get anybody to commit, but don't you have a quota? No. Don't no have quotas. quotas. You don't get bonuses if you we're, sign so many. Uh, the strength of this company right now, we're a like Jess said before, we're a company minus, which means we're allowed 75 individuals here. The state has come through and said we're allowed a 10 percent overage, so we're allowed actually about 83 people here. We're sitting right now at 78. So we've got five openings, uh, but we're not really. It's not really urgent that we fill them because okay. we're over 100 percent strength. Now, and you're so. not looking for that oddball to be one of those no, either. No. You want people who are run-of-the-mill good people. It used to be when I joined the the, the service originally it was during the Vietnam era, and uh, the recruiters could come right into court and take people out and put you in the service. That's that's not the way it is anymore. We're uh, we're yeah. looking for high-caliber individuals, and uh, we can be really picky.
Okay. Now, once they're in, they're going to be in for a long time. Six-year enlistment will get you the benefits. Uh, uh, by that, I mean the college benefits, uh, all uh -huh. of the uh, extra benefits that you're going to get. Now, every male in the United States, a lot of people don't know this, is obligated by virtue of being born in the United States to eight years of military service. It used to be six years, now it's eight. So you can fulfill your military obligation and serve your country, pick up some real good college benefits by joining the Army National Guard. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, in uh, Israel, they have to serve so many years, but they don't make you do it. Even though you're obligated, they don't... Exactly. Everybody There's no don't draft do it. right now. No, they there don't used do to it. be a draft, uh, and, but if the draft ever comes about again, every male is obligated for eight years of service. Okay. But if they'd already put in eight years here, they couldn't call them? Are you, is that what you're saying? No, they wouldn't. Exactly. If, but if you were active, <laughs> they would call you. If you're active, you'll be, be called, called into, the, oh. into the fray. Right. Do most people re-enlist after six years? We have a, a very high re-enlistment rate. Now, uh, some fellas, and I've seen this, the, usually the reason fellas get out on their first enlistment is they'll join with us, they'll uh, serve their six years, they'll pick up their college money, they'll get their college degree. Uh, at the end of their six years, they're just starting out in their career. They want to get established in their career, they want to use their degree that uh, they've, they've gotten by virtue of being with us. And once they get their career established, I find that they come back after about two years and say, okay, I'd like to get back in now. I'm, I'm well on my way on my career. So. Do you ever have anybody who's interested in, you know, they think they want to join, and after discussing it with you, you find out that they would be better uh, suited or happier with the reserve, and you might tell them to go see the reserve instead? No, we don't get too much of that. You don't have much of that, where they want to be more into a specialized... Well, and, and, and I... Th I, I I want to pat myself on the back for that because I make it perfectly clear that this is the infantry. This is the the, the hardest it's going to get. I mean, and if you're going to join here, you're going to be out in the woods on a drill weekend, overnight, summer, winter, rain, snow, mud. So I make it perfectly clear to them that this is a, a difficult thing to do. If this is not what you're looking for, you know, I would just assume you go and see someone else. Okay. But, uh, so it's pretty, pretty clear to them. Do you feel people out there should at least check you out? At least find, if they're Definitely. interested in military at all, they ought to at Definitely. least find out what you've got to offer on a one-on-one -on -one basis and I'll then set up an go from there. You. Call me at 563-6184. I'll set up an appointment with you. And your folks, uh, there's no secrets here. I don't try to talk to uh, the young folks and keep their parents out of it. I like to talk to the parents because the parents understand too. Okay. And no obligation. No obligation. Thank you very much for talking with Sergeant Don Dixon. He's the recruiter and the maintainer here in the... Uh, Army National Guard building in Marsonville, New York. We're going to show you some of the equipment that is used, I guess, by the people out here on an every, I shouldn't say every day, but every week, every weekend when they're on duty basis. We're talking to a man here. It says Light. It's awfully easy to remember the last name. It says it right there. See, Light. His name is not Army. It's Light. First name is. Brian. Brian. Okay, Brian. Are you from Plattsburgh? I'm from Katyville. Katyville. Always lived in this area? Yes, I grew up in Morrisonville down the road here. So. Okay. What What are we looking at? You've obviously you've set this up for us this morning. We appreciate all, all right. the work you've done here. Uh, so when you come here, it's not just uh, maneuvers outside or just PT training. Uh, you all, everybody in the group know how to use most of this equipment? Yes, that's correct. When uh, we get a, come in for a weekend, we get our marching orders from the company commander, and dependent, depending on what he wants us to do and what we have to do to accomplish our mission, we go and get certain tools at a trade, which we have demonstrated on display here for you. Uh, these are just the basic tools of our trade, uh, what we use every almost every weekend okay. when we're preparing for our missions. Tell us what some of these are. Uh. Well, these are some of the communication devices that the infantry platoons and companies uh, have available to them. Uh, for instance, this would be a squad radio. A squad leader would use this to uh, communicate with his platoon leader on this radio, which he has. Okay, he'd have this on his person. No, uh, the platoon leader, which is the officer, of course, he has somebody carry this for him. Okay. And, and then the squad, squad leader would have this on his waist with his equipment. Okay, he has this one. This would be in a vehicle? or No, this would be on the, what they call the RTO's back, the radio oh, telephone okay. operator's back. He's responsible. He's assigned to the platoon leader. He's responsible for all communications. Whatever the platoon leader tells him, uh -huh. he's, he, he transmits it. It may not be pretty like the ones you see with the chrome and all of that, but these are very serviceable. They can take an awful lot of abuse, I assume. Oh, yes. Right? Take and they work very, very well. Um, 
So these are used on a, nearly every weekend by yes. somebody it's no, for training? These are used uh, every time we get together, they're, they're used whenever okay. we're in a field environment. And you don't need the wire. The wire is for? The wire is for communication also, if depending on the mission, like I said, more or less a uh, defend mission or if we're going to be in one spot any period of time, rather than put the uh, communication over the air or, or for a long distance away, we'll roll out the wire. This is a quarter mile of wire in this particular roll right here. Uh -huh. And we'd have, uh, the company commander would have a phone on his end and we'd have a phone or you would have it what they call platoon net within the platoon each squad would have a phone and the platoon leader would have a phone because this is radio anybody with the same frequency could pick up what you're saying yes correct and correct. this they couldn't of course this is going to be a, that's a, some a, more, a, a sealed unit so to speak more secure unless somebody taps into it or oh, unless they tap in right, right. now binoculars I, I suppose yes those are binoculars that we would use on an observation post along with a wire and uh, Anybody, observation post would be out in front of our uh, position and it's our early early warning device type situation where we have two personnel, two or three personnel out there. They would give us early warning of enemy movement or anybody coming our direction. They would call us on the phone or send a messenger back to our platoon area. Okay. Uh which is normal helmet. You'd all have one of those. Right. Everybody, everybody in the Army, I think, I hope, has one of these. It's the new Kevlar model, new design. We got a, This shield is for our civil defense mission, but it pops right off. You usually don't have that on. No, not that unless would be we're doing for, our civil defense okay. training. But they redesigned it from the old steel pot. They're covered more protection of your neck and ears. Uh-huh. Down around the back on the sides. Uh-huh. Are those heavy? No, they're, they're heavier than the, uh, I think they are. I, I know they are. Depending on what size head you have. I mean, if you yeah. have a large head, you're going to have a larger helmet, of course. If you see people uh, on Monday morning well, kind of walking like this, you figure they've been to their uh, National Guard training over the weekend and they've been wearing this. It takes a while to get used to them. I guess it is heavy. It's uh, made of Kevlar, much the same material as a Humvee is on the side. So. Okay. And this is also, a, this is a bulletproof, a flag vest, they call it. This is what we would wear. It's in also heavy. Actual in combat zone. And we would also wear it in our civil defense mission. These are about five, six pounds a piece themselves. You wear these periodically to get used to them, having them on and so forth? Yes. Uh, different training? Different training, depending, like I say, uh -huh. on the mission. Is there enough here to, for everybody has one of yes, these? Yes, everybody's assigned. Uh, everybody's assigned to one of those. A full complement of equipment. See, that's quite thick. There's a, there's a lighting in there that will, that will stop the... It, the bullet when you get below there. I don't think you have any protection. No, below or on the armpits on the side. Yep. Just, you got a little bit. Yeah, but this is where the uh, where you're more likely to be. Uh, covers your vital organ. The right? vital organ. That's the word I want right there. Now this vital organ right there. Now that I've seen cops with one of these, but well, not that. This, this is called a riot baton, and this oh. is used in our def civil defense mission also. You don't it's, hit people on the head with this. No, this purely a defensive weapon. Okay. Uh, they, I'm told you hit him in the shins or you hit him on the clavicle right there. Right. Huh? That's the place that'll stop him. All right. We would, I guess I, we didn't see any uh, snowshoes. Everybody in the company can be assigned to snowshoes. Like I say again, is uh, the mission, depending what, well, obviously the last month we had a lot of snow. Everybody had these on and it was quite a treat to see people when they were warm before carrying their backpack full of gear. Uh -huh. And they take getting used to because you can't walk normally. You have to walk sort of pigeon toed and lift them up. But, but you had a lot of, lot of opportunity well, this year, didn't you? Oh, we had a lot you? of practice. Yes, we did. You could use them this morning on the 7th of April. That's an awful thing to say, too. Yes, it is. And, of course, these are the boots. I think someone mentioned to me before they're insulated. Right. These are extreme uh, cold weather boots. What, what there is is a bladder of air in between, in between soles. I'm not sure how they're put together, but there is an air pocket in here. That's what makes them so warm. And if you're going up an aircraft, you have to open a valve so they so they can adjust the air pressure. Is that right? Yeah. And I was told. I think Jim mentioned to us earlier that uh, you could be out there in a couple of days with these, and it wouldn't affect your your feet. Would be pretty well protected. Your feet would be warm as, with minimal movement. They'll stay warm. You have to change your socks. Because a lot of perspiration, your, huh? right? Yeah. Depending on the person, of course. Okay. And this is a uh, a large Alice pack. What they call an Alice pack. This has probably got a basic load in it. Probably weighs 40 pounds. Well, that helps to keep your head back with that heavy helmet. You can't lean too far when you got this on your back. Makes you stand up straight, yeah. Gosh, yeah. Or you lean over from the weight. Now, when you get out on the field where you're going, you take them off and set them down. You don't carry this all day long. No, no. This is 
we carry this to what we call our patrol base, where we're going to be operating out of, depending where that is. Then we drop these camouflage our equipment, and okay. we take what we need. What do you carry in something like this? What do you consider you need when you go out and you got this packed? Well, if we were going out today, I'd want to have something warm, and a change of clothes in case I fall in some water or something. And we basic food, probably one pack of MREs, which I don't see we have displayed here. But we'll get one for you. Okay. A uh, change of underwear, uh, at least minimum of a six pair of socks, foot powder. And six pair of socks? Yes. Okay. At least six pair. Got to keep your feet dry. That's the main thing the infantryman wants to do is keep his feet dry. That's what's taking care of him. Uh-huh. That's the clacker for uh, anti-personnel mine, which we have one on display here. Say that again? It's an anti-personnel mine. It's called a Claymore. Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, okay, this is... Anti-personnel mine. Right. That means that you don't want people following you. You can set one of these up. If you're uh, or you're defending a certain area, say we had a platoon defense and we had to cover up, cover some routes that we didn't have enough manpower to cover, we'd set these in a trail or wherever the high-speed avenue of approach would be for troops, run the electric cord back to where our position is, hook this in, and you can detonate it just by squeezing it. Oh, I'm sorry. This would set off the... Right. This is the device itself that blows up. It's filled with metal pellets. Oh. Buckshot size uh, ball bearings. That blows up. Yeah. Like, it's like a hand grenade uh, yeah. with a wire. Well, it's got C4 plastic in the back, so you can imagine the uh, once uh -huh. it detonates, what oh, it's yeah, going to do. Yeah. This is just that detonates it right here? Yeah, it was an M57 uh, device, uh, which detonates the. Uh, Man's the inhumanity cell. turned bad. That's exactly right. You've probably seen a lot of these on TV. This this part of the user. I may have, but I didn't know what they were doing. I probably didn't have any idea. Get rid what they of the bad doing. guys, basically. Okay. And these are some practice or uh, training devices. This is uh, an art artillery simulator. You pull a pin, throw it, it'll whistle, then it'll blow up. It's a quarter stick of dynamite. It's pretty. If it lands near you, you're going to get the uh, actual experience of what something exploding near you is going to be like. Oh, this is simulator. Okay. Right, it's a simulator. Okay. It simulates the best we can uh, without wow. killing anybody. We yeah. want to train the way we want to fight, but we don't want any casualties. Yeah, right. And we use smoke grenade for signaling or masking movement or whatever the case may be. Each uh, squad carries about three or four of these. Uh huh. And some other tools of the trade. This is an anti-tank device. It's called the Law, lightweight. Or that that sh uh, fires a projectile. This fires a. Projectile, right? And you can put. They have training projectiles, 30 meters, 30 millimeter training projectiles. One person handles this. One person, right? It's a shoulder-held weapon. Does that get awfully hot when you? No, no. No. I'm, as long as you don't put your hands in the front or the rear. Uh huh. The blast will come out the back. This is the back of the weapon. What fires it? Uh, there's a there's a shell in here. Uh huh. The shell yes. goes way inside. All right. This this part holds the, the round itself right here. Okay. The explosive and the shell is in, in on the inner tube. See, this collapses. Okay. It'll go right inside this case right here. And there's a carrying strap. You just sling it over your back and you're, you're on it, your way. And you've probably got it. Is it enough to to uh, penetrate the tank or is it mostly to get rid of the tracks? Well, these here, I don't think they'll penetrate the new ones. They have, uh, they have all kinds of new weapons out now. Stingers, they call them stingers. Okay. And they have dragons, which is a heavier weapon. These will disable... A tank, though, okay. if you hit them in the right spot. Right. And some more of the individual gear is like we have field. This is with the new field protective mask that replaces the old one they used in Desert Storm. That's got the hood on it. You can't really see it because it's covered up with a hood. But uh -huh. There's a canister that goes on the side right here that filters out everything. Whereas I the old one was all self-contained within the cheeks here. Uh -huh. I think Jim mentioned, I think it was Jim or uh, Sergeant Dixon mentioned the uh, Eight or nine seconds, you can uh, be ready to put this on, ready to go? Yep. Nine seconds is, is the standard test uh, to because have this on. Because at 10, you're in trouble. Right. <laughs> you better get it on. Huh? Yep. You're not going to have much time. I mean, okay. if you're holding your weapon, you've got your helmet on. Eight and nine seconds isn't, isn't a lot of time. We put nine seconds to spare. Yeah. This guy to work right here. Yeah, you want to you know, let, let him put this on. Can you put this on for us? Yeah, we can clear it, though, without the canister. Yeah, what? Yeah. Well, first, we better find out who he is. Blanchard. Yes. Okay. What's your first name? Scott Blanchard. Scott Blanchard. Is this your mask Blanchard? No, it's not. It's not fitting to his head. Oh, that's it. You, you got to be fitted to your own head. Well, he could do that while we're going down the table. Okay, yeah, let me let me get it fitted and then we'll do it. Okay, we'll be he'll be right back. We're going to demonstrate that for us.
And this is the carrying case. It's much bigger than the old one. And it looks like a suitcase. You carry all this, all this gear, all the individual equipment on this table, such as the radio, the helmet, this gear here, which is called the LBE, load bearing equipment. It's carried on your person, so you can imagine. That's and this, in addition to the backpack. In addition to the backpack, in addition to the uh, flight jacket, if you're wearing those. Your weapons. I only weigh 160 pounds, and when we're going out on a winter mission, my total weight, and I get done loading with my weapon and everything, is about 245. I know what you. I know what you're talking about now. I can. I can so. visualize that. <laughs> <laughs> These are uh, night division, or night observation. Well, they call them nods. Night vision goggles, the MVGs. Yeah, you actually put them right on your head and right. leave them there. Put them on your head. You can. These are they're they're adjustable. The I, these the eyepieces will adjust this. Give you an idea. This is a two-piece system. A head harness, which can go over your head. Uh -huh. You adjust it and you just slap it into the into the harness and. Would most people each you, each person out there have one of these? No, no well, just certain people. Certain people. There's uh we have enough for three per squad right now within the platoon. But we have a large complement of other devices like the uh, uh -huh. the scopes and the observation devices that goes on the individual weapons. Is, these, this, is this very old? This type these of are fairly new, these here. We, that replaced uh, the ones we had. The ones we had before this were like a square box that just fit over your face. Uh -huh. And these, uh, I believe these amplify the existing light or darkness, whatever you want to call it, 10,000 times. So it can be pitch black in front of you, and you can't see the hand in front of your face. You put these on, you'll be able to see. You look looking through pea green soup, like those special lenses they use for TV. That's, yep. what, that's exactly yep. what they look like. Well, I think the camera here has one that call. You can uh, make your get more light in it, and it's amazing. It's lighter than it actually is. Right. Uh, and if you can't, if you have to read a map or you can't, there isn't enough light. It has a what they call an IR switch, infrared infrared switch you just flip it on and it emits an mm -hmm. infrared ray out of the corner here and it'll illuminate what you have to see the only problem with that is if the enemy has these capabilities they'll be able to see that light also so you have to be careful yeah. you look in you see the guy looking back at you right now tell me from what you're telling me you don't you don't spend your eight hours a, a day when you're here for this training uh, uh, from eight in the morning till five in the afternoon it's an all night two it's day it's a continuous type 24 thing, hour right. deal like if we uh, hit the ground at 4 in the morning, or say we come in on Saturday morning, we hit the ground as soon as we can, and we could continue right through till 3, 4 in the morning Sunday, and then just a couple hours rest and huh. drive on from there. Who carries the portable TV to watch the ball games? In the well, we've been trying to get the company commander to do that. <laughs> he well, doesn't do he that. He doesn't huh? go for it. He doesn't go. <laughs> All right. All right. And this is probably important, too, because they don't always have that big uh, MK... MKT, all right. MKT, exactly. I nearly remembered it. They, but they do have this. And this is a meal ready to eat individual uh, beef stew. Now, is this carried by your, your right. also in your pack? In your pack or on your person. If we're going without our pack, if we're traveling as a platoon as a whole, and say we're going to be gone away from the MKT, well, you can carry up to four of these at any one time. Peanut butter. I don't know what you put it on, but this is peanut butter. Oh, they got peanut you butter. Got, you, you got, got a accessory kit with hot sauce, chewing gum, toilet paper. Here's the main meal, I believe. That's the beef stew. Beef stew. And we got crackers and a spoon and a drink to... Yep. Grape drink. And they give you a dessert, I believe. Cherry nut cake. Okay. See, you just, army marches on his stomach, and this is the stomach right here. Yeah, that's it. It's part of the marching unit. And uh, this is what you call your all-purpose uh, utensil right here. That's right. Huh? Save it's, 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 uh, it's the fork, it's the spoon, it's the, uh, the knife on the other end. You got it all at one spot. All right, what? All right, is someone going to show us this? Uh, are you ready to? Yes, I'm ready. To you're ready to? Okay, Scott, you're going to show us uh, what happens when you have to put on this, this gear. It's where now? It's Okay, you've got it in your hand. in my hand. All right. Now, this nine seconds, it's already, it's already in there. You can take it out and put it out in nine seconds. Don't do that. You don't have to do that. Right. But Okay, show us how this is going. To, it's fitted. You, you have fitted it to your head a little bit. Yes, exactly. Okay, we're going to show you what this does. It's kind of frightening, really. I haven't seen it, but it is frightening to think. I think the danger of this during the... Uh, you know, the, uh, Gulf War. the Gulf War 
what was the was the worst part of it. Right. Well, there was actual bio or chemical agents used over there. They haven't really identified them, but there, there's people showing signs of being exposed to biological and chemical yeah. agents over there. If you remember when you were watching it on TV, they showed the buildings where the reporters were. They all wore masks. You know, they said it might be impossible to. Okay, show us right. what's happening. That's it. Now, uh, basically, it, if any part of your body was exposed, it, it, is, it isn't as bad as it could be. In other words, if, uh, like I saw a little slit here somewhere, but mainly it's the breathing part. Is that correct? Right. It depends what kind of agent they're using. Okay. And how long can you wear that comfortably before it gets, to, I don't mean, it's maybe never comfortable, right? But how long could you keep it on, say, and... Uh, uh, well, depending on... An hour? The new ones are different, though. We never had to, we haven't used the new ones yet, but a minimum of eight hours. Eight hours? But people have been wearing them a lot longer than that. Wow. Have special attachments on the canteens. Uh-huh. Yeah. You hook a tube right of course, up. it's not all here because he has a canister on the side, at least one canister, right? Right, you're going to have a, the round canister. That would, that would be. have access to right now. Is that, what does this do? This, he can drink, this is how you sustain through... Chemical. Oh, uh, and as a tube, he can drink. You plug it into the bottom of the cap of the canteen, and you just hold it upside down, and then you flip a lever in there, and a little tube will go in your mouth, and you'll be able to suck the water right out of there. You know, there are some uncomfortable spots, but when you're wearing something that's uncomfortable, to go to the uncomfortable spot, it's you know, just being where you are is bad enough. Right. But then when you have to do this type of thing, thanks very much, Scott. You're now this zip so that you got the whole thing, and what is this? What's the lanyard for here? Well, that's to bring it up tight. Oh, to that's hook it on. Okay. Wow. At that point, you you would use a buddy system when you when you get the hood on and the button uh -huh. all up. We help each other out. Okay. They don't expect you. Uh, we don't expect anybody yep. to be alone out there. You know, it's amazing, but they're not supposed to use chemical warfare. That that's an agreement among uh, armies when they're fighting, killing each other. You won't do certain things because. Uh, but they don't necessarily follow it, but uh, there are rules. Chris, about everything we've seen so far has been defensive. And now we're getting into the offensive. Very offensive, as a matter of fact. Right. Uh, but this is called the what? This is the M60, probably most made popular by Rambo in the movie. This is what he had. And this is, uh, these are, each platoon has two of these. They used to be each squad had to. Now uh, Uncle Sam decided, oh, they must be getting heavy for the soldiers. So they come up with something new called the uh, SAW, Squad Automatic Weapon. It's an uh, M16 machine gun made, an M16 made into a machine gun. It puts a lot more lead down range. It doesn't have the punching power as the M60, but it'll put a lot of lead down range. Okay, let's go back again now. It's an M60. This is the size of the shell. These yep. are dummies. Those are these dummies. Are, this is a blank. These are NATO blank rounds right here. That's oh. the size. Okay. Now, this you would carry. You can carry this. Right. And then you right. said there's two to a platoon? There's two. Two of these weapons assigned to each platoon. How many people in the platoon? 33 to 40, and they were dependent on the mission. Okay, so that the other... 21 or up to 28 are going to be carrying a M16 rifle? Various weapons. They'll be carrying uh, M16s, uh, our grenade launchers, uh, and saws. They're, those are the weapons. Of, those are, these are the tools of our trade. Uh-huh. And this is also set up so you can, you can have it set up like a, at a spot while you're laying down or out of, right. a, out of a trench or something? We have tripods for these and the bipod, which is a quick, quick setup. A tripod would be, as I said, if we were going to stay in any one spot any length of time, he can just train the weapon, set it up to where he wants it, and use a quick quick release, quick movement type thing, and it'll be right on the same target. And how many of these, how many rounds per minute? These are, uh, where's my, I believe the cyclic rate of fire is 750 rounds a minute. 750, it's got to get awfully, awfully hot. She gets hot, yeah. You can change the barrel. You can what? Change the barrel on them. You have to change the barrel every 200, well, for every 400 rounds for blanks, I believe. You're supposed to change the barrel. You have two men assigned to this weapon. One guy just to help carry the extra ammo and, and materials that you use with it. 
He's the assistant. He's and assistant. then he take, you take the barrel off, put the other one on, let this right. cool off a little bit. Right here. And he'll feed the ammo, he'll change the barrel for you, and he'll sight targets for you, and he'll, he'll help protect you with his weapon while you're operating this one. And that's that automatic. Voice, I believe, this is Pull the picker, the, the trigger, and it right. just keeps right on going. Right. Is this the one made by GE over in Burlington? Or, some, or were those more or less for... Uh, GE made some of these, and they got so hot they would just get red. Yeah, it's going to support Okay. These will get red if you hold the trigger down, but you're not supposed to. But they, you can turn them cherry red. You're not, that's not the way you're supposed to fire them, though. That's why you have two men to the system. Uh -huh. One guy gets tired, you can, you can interchange with them. Now, is this also to go on the end of a of, of the? Oh, it does go on, huh? It's a no. Now that's heavy gauge. That's nearly awfully close to a quarter inch thick. It's the thickest spot here, and it attaches to the. I don't know if it'll attach to that one or not. Wow. No. It has the, uh, this has a grenade launcher, so it won't uh -huh. attach. Okay. But it slides right on over the end. And this tool not only is for offense when you run out of bullets, hopefully that you'll never get down that far where you have to use it as a, a defensive weapon on the end of your rifle. But it's a wire cutters, it's a saw, it's a you know toothpick, whatever. You, uh -huh. it, it interchanges with a case. For, you, know, you can use it for a number of different things, but... Uncle Sam really thought of different ways to take care of his soldiers, what he might use out in the field. So you can use it for wire cutters, cut trees. and uh -huh. That's a real weapon. Now, these guns, I don't remember seeing. How long have something like this been out for the, for the individual soldiers? These came out, I don't know, just after Vietnam, just after Vietnam or towards after the tail Vietnam, end of huh? it. They got rid of the, uh, what they called the blooper, and they put it on the M16. Uh, this 203, what is it, the nomenclature is M203, grenade launcher. And the uh, person operating this piece of equipment will have a vest with various types of cartridges, 40 millimeter cartridges. You'll have buckshot, you'll have uh, explosive, HE, mm -hmm. and you'll have smoke, you'll have uh, illumination grenades, and you can all be deployed from this, this weapon here. It's up to the, uh, the platoon leader to decide what he wants deployed in a certain situation. If he wants smoke over a certain area, he'll say smoke 203 over here. And he can launch a smoke right. with that? Right. Through a squad leader, tell him where to put it. And the same okay. way with uh, at night, if he wants some alum, if he's with the first squad, he'll tell the first squad leader to get me some light somewhere, and the grenade launcher can put some light uh -huh. up in the airplane. Now, this is a scope on the top. Yep. Look at the size of that sighting scope. Do you have any idea what any power that is? Not really. It's a night that vision scope. Night, oh, it's a night vision. Okay. Right. Now, is that a sniper's weapon also? It can be at night, but uh, he won't put it on a saw. It's the, this is the one, the only one for the saw. They the what? Saw, squad automatic weapon, that's okay. what this one was called. <laughs> okay. The M249 saw. The, uh, what it's used for is this is a high output weapon, and it's crucial to the squad or the platoon, so they'll have a night vision device on it so he can see what's going on. So all the people in your, I don't know if I use the right words, in your battalion, in your squad, whatever, can run most of these yes. pieces of equipment. Everyone's yes. assigned to a certain weapon as right. a job. Right, but he does know how to operate the others. Exactly. Because if this, one of these guys are disposed of and nobody else knows how to do the second part of this gun, you're in trouble. We're constantly cross-training on weapon systems and uh, personnel. And uh, it makes any member of any platoon should be able to go to any other company and any other platoon and be able to run the platoon's equipment. That's what the uh, main purpose of the Army's cross-training is for. If you figure the number of uh, shells this can fire, the difference in the size here, uh, you've got to carry a lot of ammunition around, and you can't carry it out in your body. There's no more room. Right. For every right. 100 rounds of this, it equals 200 rounds of this. In, in, uh, in weight. In weight. Now, is someone just carrying ammunition? Is there is it battle condition? His he assistant carrying gunner, the assistant gunner for this will carry the, the bulk of the ammunition, but then the rest of the ammunition is distributed between the platoon or the squad right. that he's assigned right. to. Uh, you know, we people who have not been out there, I was in the Navy, and of course we didn't have to go very far for our stuff, but you're, you're in the front line going up. How far back is the supply of more of these? You know, if you've got carrying four of these and you run out, how far back is the rest of the ammunition generally? Well, depending on the type of mission, it's a, the new Army doctor now is... Uh, you're not supposed to outrun your spy, obviously. I don't know how okay. much I can say about okay, it. Okay, so what you're, you're saying too, is that... You're never too far away from it. All right. People assigned to the right, supply. They have certain, All right. Uh, we have our supply sergeants usually yeah. pretty good. Now, remember, a lot of this equipment we're hearing is in the United States by people who are not law enforcement or military. Some of this stuff is being used in the streets. Right. Huh? Usually, it's not uh, 
stuff like this. Desserts. It's not these or those. It's not as high powered as that. You're seeing stuff similar to the M16. Well, M16. that's uh, about yes. Now, how far away can this be effective? 1,100 meters. 1,100 meters. That's Absolutely. three quarters of a mile. Yeah. Three quarters of a mile. Yeah. If you can see it, you can hit it. There's no doubt about it. And the uh, maximum range of the bullet that fires from this or that or that is 3,600 meters. Wow. Yeah, you're talking nearly, oh, nearly two miles. Yeah. Okay. Anything else that we should know? I don't know what... The, now, this is a, called... A, is that a 9 millimeter? I just I heard that on right. TV. Right. That's it. It's an M9, 9 millimeter. It's carried by our M60 gunners and our officers and our medics. And the average soldier isn't, doesn't have one? No. No. Is there a reason for that? Wouldn't you think you'd have a backup of that? I know it's, you, it's hard to hit anything, what, over 25, 30, 25 yards? Can 75 you, feet. You can hit about up there. Beyond that, it's not really... Right. You can't hit it, right? It's hit and miss, you know. If you hit it, it'll, it'll still hurt, but oh, yeah. it, <laughs> yep. you can't hit it. Yep. Yeah. Now, there's the place for the clip that goes in the end. Is that one of those clips here? No. That slips in with nine shells in it? Is that the idea? Thirteen. Thirteen? Yep. That's a semi-automatic Beretta, 9mm yep. Beretta. Police using this today? Yes. Some of those, some are using the Glocks, depending on the... But it's a 9mm caliber. And what is it, what does a 9mm caliber mean? Is that the, the, the diameter of a shell? Yes. Is that what the it means? Of the lead itself. Right. Okay. It's a small... The lead itself, the widest part is 9mm. So if you're looking at a millimeter scale, it would give you an idea. That's 9 one-hundredths of a... Uh, of a yardstick, so to speak. Right, that width right there. Okay, that's the width. Yep. Right here. For a nine millimeter. And this is a uh, five point five six metric, which converts to about a two twenty three. This is seven point six two, which is basically a three oh eight. And everybody in this room, including Calvin and I, hope this never really has to seriously be used. Right. Want to use it for practice only. Right. Okay, we're at the uh, Army <laughs> National Guard on uh, Route 3, just uh, east of the community of Marshallville, next to the fairgrounds. I'm Bob Ben, Calvin Castine and the camera. You're watching Hometown Cables on every day, remember, 1 o'clock, 4.30, 8 p.m., midnight, and 8 the following morning. This show called What's Going On Here uh, has been on now for three years plus is every Sunday. Five times, we hope that uh, you watch, at least tune in to find out what's on. You may not like them all, but uh, uh, at least uh, find out what's on. Uh, Calvin, with all the other things during the week, all the meetings, the ball games, and uh, whatever's happening in the northern tier, uh, he's making an attempt uh, to show it to the people up here. And Thanks for watching us and all the other fine programs on, uh, on cable. And don't forget, if you're not already a patron, uh, $12 or more to Hometown Cable, 1477 Ridge Road. And the snow will stop sooner or later. We've been talking off camera, and I've been learning all about the setup of an army. I was in the Navy, and I don't know what I'm talking about at all when it comes to army and the setup, and this is set up like a regular army. Is that correct? Right. So here's what I've learned, and he'll correct me as I tell you. I'll tell you very simply. There is such a thing as a division. You must have heard that when you watch the war movies and everything else. There is a division. Within uh, a division, I forgot how many brigades you got. Well, the brigade, would actually, the brigade is actually... Yep. Right. Okay, the one... Okay. Right. That's right. Brigades one? Two brigades. Two brigades. Uh, under each brigade, there are battalions. Like we heard talking when, when Mr. D uh, Sergeant Dixon was saying uh, uh, 105th Battalion, 108th, and 107th, this unit here is under the 105th Battalion. This one here is uh, 108th. Oh, 108th. Okay. Gosh, we, we're here. 108th. All right. They're under the 108th Battalion. Under the battalion, there are, each battalion has four companies. Three regular companies and a head quarters company. This company right here, let's say, is Plattsburgh. The Plattsburgh unit here is company BA, whatever it is, but this is the company. That's the level we're at. And it is under a battalion, which is the 108th, and it's under a brigade. Within the company, 
there are three platoons. Two platoons are here physically, and one is in Saranac Lake, which we, we heard along the way someplace. Is that correct? Uh, and these figures are not exactly because we're not here to, to find out things we shouldn't know. About 33 people in three platoons or in one platoon? One, one platoon, 33 people. All right, so there's three regular and a headquarters platoon. Under each platoon, there are squads, three squads under each platoon. About nine people in a squad. Each squad has two teams made up of four people, one of which is in charge of that team. So there's two teams. So what we have are two teams, three squads, three platoons under one company, which is Plattsburgh. Everybody we've talked to so far, anybody you see, is on a team of some kind. Is that correct? He's on a team. Now, the platoon leader, this is a platoon, the platoon leader... Okay, now we're going to get into faces. The platoon leader is not here. You are the platoon leader. I was talking to the platoon leader all this time. Your first name? George Rodriguez. George Rodriguez is the platoon leader. So he is directly underneath the company commander. Is that yes. correct? Yes, sir. Anybody who wants to talk to the com company commander under the, uh, your platoon has got to come through you first. You don't just go and talk to the, cap to the yes. captain. Is that yes, correct? Sir. That's what the, they call a military protocol. And you tell me what's happening next, George. Uh, next, next in command is platoon sergeant, which would be uh, Sergeant Light. Okay, he is under, is in your platoon? He's, he's not my platoon sergeant, but he's one of the platoon Okay, you have a platoon sergeant also. Yes, okay. I do. Yeah. And um, his job, he's mostly in charge of, um, when we're in the field, he's in charge of the beans and bullets. And uh, like you said before, he's in, tar uh, in charge of individual training, while I'm in charge of collective training, um, tactics and things like that. Um, under platoon sergeant is a squad leader. Okay, um, we got, and there's, yeah, three there's three squads under squad the one leaders. platoon, right? There's three squad okay. leaders. Um, we don't have one here, but um, they're in charge of their squad, everything their squad does. Um, I, tell, I tell the squad leaders what to do, and the squad leaders tell their people what to do. Um, and the squad leaders have two team leaders. We have Sergeant Harris, he's a team leader in first squad. All right, squad, and who's the other? Uh, uh, Sergeant right. Ganyo, he's a Ganyo, leader, uh, these leader two, in third squad. Are they under your, in your platoon? Both these guys are my platoon. Okay, group. they are in charge of these two teams down here, right? Or squads? Teams. Both teams. Both. Under both, they're team leaders, and they got three other people in your, that you're in charge of. Right. That, That's fair correct. enough? Yeah. All right, so that under you, as a platoon leader, are nine times three, or 27, plus four is that is that correct no, it's, um, and yeah this is all this is all figured together oh they're all okay. so i have three platoons of nine men plus i have a headquarters attachment i have uh, two m60 teams okay which is four people there and a uh, rto okay. which is a radio telephone operator how do you get to be a pl how do you get to be there so quick um, You're the youngest guy here. <laughs> go to college. You go to college? college. Yeah. You gotta go to college. I told you, you, Sergeant Dixon said in there, you gotta go to college. You gotta go to college. I went through ROTC and I got commissioned through that. Okay. And uh, now. Hey, we got a team member. We got yeah. Oh, we got another. Oh, here, here's what the, the, the guy that's low on the totem pole right here. You're on a team, right? right. And this is Scott also? Yes. Blanchard. With the gas mask or with the chemical mask. <laughs> And he is under, is he on your team? It's on, my team. on your team, all right? So he, he is his su a supervisor, so to speak, yeah. right? So can he go and talk to the platoon leader without going through you? I usually use your chain of command. If he's got a problem, he'll come to me. Then I'll go to my squad leader, squad leader, up to platoon leader. Okay. That's very, yeah. very important in the military. And when you give him an order... It's the same as if the captain gave him the order. Right. Absolutely, right? Yeah. And your order to him is the same as if he got it from the, the captain or way up to the division, correct? correct? What you say he's got to do, or he's a, he's, it's insubordination. No question. Exactly. Okay. You, do you salute in, this, uh, in, in your National Guard? We still were outdoors. Um, indoors, you don't salute unless you're reporting in. Uh -huh. um, that's, that's an Army doctrine right there. Um, a lot of units, they have when you're in the field, they don't salute. Um, that's so you can't uh, distinguish rank out in the field. Let me ask you, if you're in, your, who's the newest person here in 
Are you the newest? Uh, I, I guess I'm the newest one. Okay. I joined up last Does year. Does it help you out in the reg regular everyday life, your regular job, because of the order that you have to have in this in this organization? Oh, yeah. I to make so. you a more polite or whatever you want to say, understand? Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe it, it helps uh, to follow orders and uh, to get your life in a perspective to know if you do receive an order from the military or your employer to, to follow through with it. So. That to know the reason why, what to do or die, right. they said, right? Uh, absolutely. And he's, he's the boss, you do it, unless right. it's unreasonable completely. You know what? Uh, all right. That basically, and then above the... Now, where is your battalion located? Where does your company commander, who is who? Uh, Captain Ball. Captain Ball. Captain Ball, where does he report to? Uh, it's, uh, Latham. Latham, New York. That's where his battalion commander is. Okay. That's what is set up and that's what you learn. And this, The whole thing is very, very organized, just like any uh, active army. Correct. Yeah, it's, it's based on the active army. Everything's exactly okay, the same. Yeah. Now, how does Scott move up to one of these other positions? Unless one, of, cause you're not going to get killed here like you would in a war. But what how, what does he do to move up to this other Scott's job? Um, well, you have people um, who retire or who move on. Um, let's say Sergeant Harris is moving away. Um, his slot would be open. And what they do is um, the NCOs get together to have a team leaders board. Um, he'd go in front of the team leaders board and um, they'd have maybe, let's say, 10 people go in front of this board, and they'd pick the top person out of those 10 to take that position. Okay. You know, when I worked at Customs, and I was a team leader, and you couldn't become team leader until somebody either died, transferred, or retired. And when your people who were down here would say to me in the morning, how you feeling? <laughs> it made you wonder whether he really cared or he's looking for your job, correct? <laughs> Is that right, Scott? How are you? <laughs> All right. Now, when we're taking an actual... Uh, situation like of course I watched a lot of the movies this platoon leader right here he's got his whole platoon out and they're going on a mission he gets shot killed or otherwise he's incapacitated down you go all these people under him the uh, sergeant the squads and the teams are now without a leader correct what happens okay um the way army doctrine is right now um before you go on a mission, everyone knows exactly what they're supposed to do. So if I get killed, um, usually I'm traveling with an RTO. I'll Let's say you're him. injured. Yeah, or injured <laughs> All right, or something. Yeah. Um, he'd contact a platoon sergeant or a squad, whoever he could find, and they'd immediately take charge um, of the platoon until the chain of command get established again. But the platoon sergeant would be next Okay, that on. would be like, this man right here would then be in charge of the platoon. Exactly. And heaven forbid something happens to him, you said it's the squad leader. Squad leader. We don't have one here, do we? No, squad, no, leader squad leader of the first squad yep. would be then in charge of the rest of the people. And if he gets killed, second squad leader would take his okay. place, and third squad leader, so on like that. And within the squad, the team leaders would move up to fill a squad leader's position, okay. or alpha team leader would fill the squad leader position, and a person from his team would fill okay. his position. Not that you have to know all this, but I think if the next time you watch a war movie or something, and you hear him talk about platoons and squads and and companies and battalions, you will have some idea uh, where you are in the overall picture. Just a little graph, so to speak. All right. Anything else we should cover on this? Where are you from, George, originally? I'm from around here. Right here? Right here? And how long have you been with the reserve? Um, That's the guard, rather. Four or five guard. years. Four or five years? Yeah. Where'd you go to college? In the uh, Marion, region? Alabama. Okay. How'd you pick that college? Um, actually, it was through this unit. Um, through, through here? You went through here? Um, yes. Um, there was a he was our old training NCO, and he uh, put me in contact with the school, and that's when I went to the they school. They helped pay some of your college, did they? They paid some of it, they yeah. They paid good, yeah. huh? And, Scott, where are you from? I'm originally from Michigan. Michigan? Yes. Uh, I was in the Air Force for nine years. Uh, I got out and uh, joined up. One of the individuals from this unit got me into it, and here I am. Uh -huh. So you, uh, I shouldn't say you enjoying, but uh, I, I would think the, the biggest draw is that $290 a month or whatever. Uh, the, the money's nice, but I enjoy getting together with the, the, the people, the military camaraderie that we have. Uh, uh -huh. you know, it's, I enjoy it. You know? it's, I've always liked the military life. Yeah. Okay. You know, it would be nice if you had some of those 
female uh, uh, they tell me there aren't too many in no, here yet but there's always a chance huh that's all right <laughs> Scott, you don't know if I ask you where you're from. Uh, God, originally like from downstate. Downstate? Yep, heart of the Adirondacks. And how long have you been in the uh, A little company? over a year. Huh? A little over a year. Uh -huh. year this January. Okay. You look at, what, what are you looking forward to here? Excitement. Excitement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, excitement. You find it exciting too, yes? We're going to ask somebody here, what a t who's going to tell me what a typical, we'll take a short break, and we're going to come back and get a typical day, typical weekend when you come in for that one week a, a month. Let's take a good month, May or something, where the ground is nice and you can do something. We're going to find out what's going to happen next month, probably, when they come for their two weeks. Please stay with us. Watching Hometown Cable, we're at the Army National Guard, Guard in Marsonville, New York. I had my very sketchy outline on the map over there and we were asking about how they know what's going to happen each month and do they have to plan ahead and, and uh, George tells me this is the plan for the whole year. That's correct. Right? And just to show you, these are headquarters, excuse me, requirements, training area, unit training, etc. We're going over to May. The next weekend will be May the 6th to the 8th. Now that's more than two days, that's three days. Yeah, um, what's going to happen a typical weekend in May? Uh, for, we'd have a formation um, on 6 May, which is a Friday night. We'd have that around 7, 7.30. Everybody has to be here? At night. Okay. Yeah, everyone shows up. Um, what they're going to do then is they're going to have an APFT makeup. An APFT is an annual um, Army physical fitness test. Um, people who didn't pass it this month, they're going to take it again. Um, after that, the, the squad leaders will do their pre-combat checks, which means they'll go through their, people, their, uh, their, their squad members' rucks, Make sure they bring everything they need, and um, that's and this platoon leader will give out the operation order, and they'll get ready to move out. All right, wait, can I get back to a minute? You come here in your regular clothes. We come here in BDUs, ready for formation. And that's your change. What's your, BDUs? Change your, All right, but do you here. change here uh, in your locker room, or do you change? You, you, you can. Okay, but when you go to that meeting at seven seven thirty, you're you're dressed like you are now. You're ready to go. All right, first All right. formation. Okay, and so then and you you have your squad meetings, and then what happens? Um. After that, um, what we're going to do is we're going to move out to uh, 40th and Allen, Vermont. You're going to get in your in your trucks, your units? Uh, no, we take buses. For okay. something like that, we take buses. Take Where do you get the company. bus? Um, the we either get the state gets them for us. State brings the bus? bus? Well, we put in a bid for either a commercial bus or we uh, drive a military bus. Okay. Whatever we can get our hands on, basically. You put all that gear on, all those backpacks, and everything, those, everything goes up with you. Right. You don't wear them in the bus, but you leave, you put them in the under, storage underneath. Right. If it's a commercial bus, under the bus, underneath the okay. area. And if, if we're going by military bus, we throw it on a, a truck, everything on a truck, and just go over in a convoy. A okay. It okay. says, tr you'll notice over here, it says training area. They're going to the Green Mountain National Forest in Vermont. Correct? Correct. All right. You'll get there that night? You're going to sleep outdoors? Um, yes. Most of our drills, uh, when we're out in the field, we sleep outside. You have a tent? Um, we pup tents depending are, on the weather, it's uh -huh. uh, right out in the opening. And our, like last month, uh, two months ago, when it was really cold, we had guys sleeping right out in their sleeping bags with no uh, cover over them. <laughs> just snowing on them and sleeping. Yeah. Okay, now because it's 7.30 when you get here and do it, you're not going to eat that night formally. No. We'd eat okay. that morning. Okay, um, Saturday morning? Yeah, probably 6, six in the morning. You get up we'd at what a, time? We'd have a stand to, um, which is a half hour before daylight. Okay. And probably a half hour before then, Everyone would wake up, pack their rucks, and we'd be in a, an assembly area or patrol-based perimeter, which is like a perimeter. And um, at that time, um, stand to everyone would be facing out and uh, looking for an enemy to attack. That's the most likely time for the enemy to attack. After stand to, they do personal hygiene. They eat chow. Um, you see, the most likely time that an enemy attack would be in the morning. In the early in the morning, right when um when the first the hour before sunlight or an hour after an hour, after, hour uh, after sunset. Okay. The reason being is because. At that certain time of day, the, the sky, the light from the sky and the, and the ground, they sort of blend together. You can't see as, as far. And you can't see as far or pick out certain okay. things. It's also when your troops are more tired and more relaxed. And also not quite so alert at, at, at that right, hour. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. Then what will you do there for training that day? Okay. Um, this, what we're doing here is we're going to, um, we have some people who have to qualify with M16s, um, M60s, um, the SAW, squad automatic weapons. And um, there, we have approximately 25, 30 people who have to do that. And the rest of them, are, they're going to do a, uh, I think it's a mountaineering phase one, which is not a knot corral, and uh, we're going to do a land nav. And then towards the evening, we're going to have uh, squad battle drills. 
Now, when you're doing this during the day, you stay together as teams, squads, or platoons? Well, in this particular month in this drill, it's hard to do that because we have certain individuals from each squad and each platoon that have to qualify. Some may have qualified, some may have not, so it's hard to keep squad integrity. So the ones who have to qualify will be out qualifying, and the rest, the squad leader or whoever's in charge, will take his men and uh, carry out the mission of the day, which is uh, <coughs> land navigation with a compass, uh, orienteering, and... Uh, when they qualify, they'll use live bullets that day. Right, exactly. Okay, live ammunition. And he'll take him out. He'll keep the squad busy and uh, teaching them and reinforcing the training that they already know that they may have forgotten or just to refresh them, uh -huh. such as train association, traveling through the mountains. And yeah. This is a protected area, I take it, in the right. mountain forest? Yes. That the one's not just going to pop in there when you're, when you're no, firing? No, this is all, it's like a regular post. Okay. And, uh, it's, it's all sealed off and everything. Uh-huh. Okay, that, and then uh, these are some of the other things you're going to have here? Yeah, um, if you see uh, the mortar section, yes. which is in Saranac Lake, they're, uh, they're going to be um, doing call for fires. So they'll be coming so with you too? Okay. Yep, yeah, they'll practice that. Dra dragon section, they're going to conduct the anti army ambush, and uh -huh. they're also going to call for fire. Um, um, ODP is Officer Development Planning, and NCODP is the same thing, just for NCOs. Um, these and these are just are classes at that. They have to. These we have will to be conducted up. back when we come okay. back out of the field. Now, when you eat on Saturday, will you be eating some of your packaged foods, or do, will that be a kitchen there? I don't know what the schedule is, but normally I think one meal, at least one meal, is going to be uh, uh, packaged with the MRE, and the other will be a hot one. Yeah. Okay. In the wintertime, we try to go hot and All the eat the noon meal. Okay. What was the package, the MRE at noon, because we can heat it up ourselves with squad stoves. And okay, uh, it comes at 7 o'clock at night, starts getting dark. You're not ready to go to sleep. What happens until then? Are you, are you still doing uh, um, training? This drill, we're, probably, we're not going to really do too much this drill. Um, they have battle drills and things set for the night. But on a normal drill, um, when we're out in the field, we'd have missions. During the daytime, we'd practice for these missions, and at night, we'd actually do them. Because uh -huh. um, the concept for light infantry is the night, the night is pretty much your time to move because right. you have the most cover concealment. Um, if you saw our night vision goggles. Yes, um, right. We have scopes for the weapons. So you'd be practicing those at we, night? Well, we'd be actually doing them at night oh. and practicing during the day. Okay. So at, at night time when we went out, we'd be proficient. Okay. Now, you're going to go to bed again Saturday night, get up again Sunday morning. Sunday morning. And, and more, more training on more, Sunday? More training, and we'd move back to uh, home, station. home station, which is here in Morris. Late in the afternoon? Um, we'll usually we'll probably move out of there hopefully by uh, 11 o'clock if we yeah. clear the morning. pages and everything. Okay. Yes. Now, when you get back, do you have what's called debriefings? We have what's called, they're the same thing except we call them after action reviews, AARs. Okay. The company commander will get the whole company together. Oh, the whole company. So that's all 78 men. That's his option. He can do that okay. if he wants, or he can have the platoon leaders do it. They kind of evaluate everyone. what they did. Exactly. And what they liked, what they didn't like, how they can make it better. Because uh, the private on a low end might have a good idea that nobody thought of. And if we instituted that, you know. Everybody has a, something to say when it comes to training. And that's when he gets a chance to pick on the squad, the, the, the platoon leaders like George, right? That's, you his, say he, that's his time. That's his time right there. Exactly. All right. I, I don't mean, we're not making fun of this. I'm, I'm just, uh, we're, we're just very happy here to be here with the, uh, I want to say, I always want to say Reserve National Guard and uh, let you know that they don't just come and play soldier on weekends. They're, they're training. It's, it's, a, it's a ready. Now, is there anything, any time during the year you train for the state functions that you might be called to do? If, um, that rotates within the brigade. Each battalion will have uh, a turn to do it. It's once every three years usually. I don't know if we catch it this year or we'll not. catch but it last September. Year. So last this, year? this year we do have the street force duties to us, so we'll be practicing that in December. Uh -huh. uh, techniques of different formations for uh, the uh, riot control and flood how to uh, be there you could, if you had flooding and you yep. needed some help they could call out right. it's, a, it's an organized group right mm -hmm. to get something done that's available to them if the governor if they can contact the governor and he he gets uh -huh. the okay if, 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 it, if it, we need hope we never need it so well, we are available to them what about snow shoveling are you ready for snow shoveling we've done that before well, you yes. can do it today if it keeps coming we might have to mountain rescue teams also yes. yeah we have um we, we've had a, uh, some individuals our first sergeant and other individuals have gone out and uh, searched for lost hikers. You have, all right. We have, well, that's a volunteer yeah. thing that's that a we volunteer, use their yeah. expertise and, uh, and with a 
compasses and land navigation okay. and train association. We volunteer our time for that. Okay, now if, along with the rangers. If Calvin's car is stuck out there, we get some people here go out there and do some pushing and stuff sure, like that. Sure huh? We can rustle. We got the platoon leader right here. Yeah. We got the we got the sergeant. We we we, we even got Scott uh, Blanchard. We we get him to do the work, right? That's right. right. Then you'll take us all to lunch after. <laughs> we'll be right back. We're at the uh, Army National Guard, uh, the Route Three, just outside of Morrisonville. Very evident over here in the southeast corner of this uh, training room is this sandbox. And, and I was wondering which one of the, uh, the, the guard likes to play in the sand. What is this for? Yeah, this, is a, this is what we call a sand table. And um, I would use this to brief my squad leaders on their mission that's coming up. And the squad leaders would use this, use this to uh, brief their um, squad members. Um, this area right here is on the Air Force Base, a training area we use. It's a trench line. Um, and pretty much what it is, uh, it's a depiction of the land that we took off a map. So we took a map and we put, put all the details on, um, did recons in the area, saw how it looked, and tried to make it look as, much, as close as possible as we could. Um, we'd have a mission. Um, I'd say I'd give a mission to my squad leaders and they'd write down all the information they needed. And I'd read out a whole mission spiel and they'd come back later and they'd take their squad members, they'd brief their squad members exactly what they're supposed to do on this sand table. Before they go. Before they go out. So that when they go out to the field, um, the lowest person knows exactly what they're supposed to do. So if, like you said before, there's only two men left, the two men know what their mission is. They're not um, left uh -huh. high and dry wondering what's going to happen. Yeah. Now the string, is this is laid out in some uh, kind of a quadrant? Yeah, this would be, um, they're called grid squares. Um, okay. Army maps, um, military topographical maps, they're made up of grid squares. Um, and this would be, depending on what kind of map you have, this could be a thousand meters, could be anything, usually it's a thousand meter grid square, um, and it's pretty much, they, this is how you find places, um, all right, the now, they, are they designated like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, numbered designators, like this might be 35, this might be, um, 35, or this might be 24, okay, you know, so they so would know when you're talking yeah, about it, all right, you could go, you have a protractor, so you can measure, and you could pinpoint up to 10 meters, where the where things are, be. so you could call in fire, uh, and, uh, martyrs, wherever they call it, yeah. uh, to land in this sector here, exactly. and it wouldn't uh, injure these people who are here by calling for sector twenty-seven, whatever, yeah, and everybody would know where that is. Grid corn so I'll say um, you have a call for fire mission, and let's say this area was um, Victor Delta, which is um, your map series, and um, you'd have six one three two four seven. Let's say you use six digit. Um, yeah. uh, designator and it, uh, that would land the artillery shell to 100 within 100 meters of your target as much as you may think that uh, it's just helter skelter when you see a battle and some of the war pictures or whatever I, I don't know how accurate they are it's usually planned down to the very last degree of what's going to happen correct exactly um um when you plan something you plan for the littlest thing um you have you look at your map and there might be a road right here well when you're when you're planning your your mission you're going to tell them okay when we hit this road um, we're going to plan for, you know, across this danger area. Um, if we get hit here, that's what we're going to do. If we get hit here, that's what we're going to do. And you plan the whole way through so that when, uh, if something does happen, everyone knows what they're going to do. Okay. You have something laid out here with some people defending with your little soldiers here. What would this unit be? Is this a platoon? Uh, this, the company? What is this? This is, um, our Op 4 element. We just, this is a trench line that we, um, we have on the Air Force Base that we use for training. And this is just to designate, you know, the bunkers that they okay. have there. Okay, but it would this be, what, what level are we talking about here? Is this a squad? This, um, a platoon? This, the trench line they have out there, you could put a, you could put a company in it. A it's company, a, huge a whole company, line. okay. And a com Army standards are, it's three to one. A squad, a squad can haul off a platoon, whereas if, a, if there was a squad in here, a platoon could attack it. If there's a platoon in here, a company could take it over. So it's pretty much okay. three to one odds. You, you know, wouldn't really have that flag there. No, no. Yeah, that's let's not tell people. Let's yeah. not tell people where you are. That's just to designate um, the enemy. Okay. Now, we see some one soldier position and a a two soldier position. It looks like foxholes. Yeah. Um, they've changed from foxholes. Foxholes. Um, the army took us off of um, the Vietnamese soldiers. Um, they made their. They used to have a firing ports to the front, and they found out that when they put the firing ports to the fire um, to the sides and fired oblique, they'd have interlocking uh, lanes of fire. And uh, it was it was 
a lot more successful than the old way. This is the way they have a, it's usually a M16 and a half long by two, uh, two helmets wide and it's shoulder um, armpit level deep and you'd have grenade sumps on the floor so if a grenade rolled into the um, to the foxhole you can kick it into the grenade sump and it won't hurt you as much is as... Is that like this right here? That's exact, that, exactly. So there is a place to throw that grenade that it's not going to... Yeah. And they'd also have, um, the longer you're in a position the more you improve. Um, if they were in it long enough they'd have overhead cover over the position. Uh -huh. Like, like you have here? Yeah. Like you show you some pictures here? probably can't see it here. on the camera. Okay. But um, it's approximately 18 inches thick. And it could Armpit de depth, in other words. Yep. Now, obviously, they don't come already made. You have to dig these, correct? Exactly. Uh, um, sometimes you can get engineer support where engineers will come in, but usually the, the individual positions you have to dig yourself. They'll dig like your mortar pits. Yeah. Now, these are mostly for defensive positions, more yes. than else. You can't yes. very well. When you're moving out, you can't be digging these. No. Um, okay. When you're moving out and you stop, you usually find a hasty fighting position, which would be like a shallow depression, maybe six to twelve inches deep, with a small right. berm. The plans were coming here was then, like he says, they have a place out on the air base uh, field where they they go out and do your training. A plan was to go out there and have an actual training, see some firing, and uh, the eight inches of snow we've got this morning, of course, kind of kill that off, eh, Jim? And uh, you either will take some video yourself of that for us to add in or something you already have, or we'll come down again, one of the, one of the three. Uh, we haven't seen much of the building. There's a lot of rooms in the building. Now, if you're outside training, what do you use all these rooms for in this pretty large building? Okay, um, this room right here is pretty much our briefing room. Um, we come in here, this is where we have our meetings um, during, during the month. We have uh, uh -huh. usually two meetings a month, um, Tuesday nights. And we come in here and everyone talks about what they're going to do. And you see the board in the far corner. Yes. Um, down it's below. a plan for August. We plan two or three months in advance so that we know what's going to happen. Now, who do, who's in at those meetings? Um, platoon leader, company commander, XO, first sergeant, platoon sergeant, and squad leaders, and usually team leaders also. Okay. So it gets to be a number of people. Yeah. Everybody except Scott Blanchard. Yeah. He's exactly. the only one in this group that won't be there. So he can go to the movie that night or go to a ball game, correct? Yes, yeah. he could. There's advantages, Scott. All right. This is a this is the Ethan Allen firing range. This is the way it gives you all your topographical. That's a military map. Right That's here. a military map. It shows you um, the, your grid squares, uh, elevation, terrain features. Is it safe to say that if any place they're going to fight a battle, they'd have something like this for that area? Yeah. Um, in most instances. Yeah, the army has maps pretty much for almost any area. Anywhere in the, in the if world. If not, they can make them yep. really fast. So so that they would have some idea of the elevation, where there's a hill, where there isn't, where there's a river, so that if you were lost and you knew you were here, you'd know you'd have to go north to get to the river or whatever. Is that exactly. logical? Okay. Uh, let's see, what else are we going to cover while we're in here? All these books, is this a study? Um, this is just, this is just uh, we're getting ready for a mobilization exercise coming up, and these are mobilization plans that we've yeah. been working on. I guess anybody out there who's wants to know more about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the guard that would like to become a part of it is to check with uh, Sergeant uh, Don Dixon or any of these people that you've seen and, and ask them how to get out here. There's not a lot of room right now. There's room for five people. Approximately five people. Um, we're pretty much up to strength. We're going to over strength now. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, see, I'm not here to advocate it. That's not why we're here. We're here to let you know what is happening in this nice building in this very uh, you know, central location where it's, everyone knows, has seen the building, wonder what's inside. This is what's inside. And that's what these uh, colored uniforms, do you go out and lunch with, for these at all? Uh, yes. Right? And if you wonder what it is, it's, it's the National Guard. And there's also um, community rooms in the back where if uh, anybody, like uh, Boy Scouts have used it, they can go out in the back and it's a big like, conference room. Uh -huh. And that's open to the public. Okay. All right, we'll take a short break and come back and close out. We're still at the National Guard, at the Army National Guard, because there is an Air National Guard. And they do the same thing you do, except that it's Air... It's more like the Air Force. Air Force related. Okay. This, I guess, is a fire plan, you said, Jim? Yes. Jim Guy, you were talking to. But gives you an idea of the building uh, overall. See what I know. This is the big room we started in where we saw the the trucks. That's the drill hall. The drill hall. 
Then you come out into a hallway. This is right outdoors. I believe this is the room we were in, uh, talking with the various military equipment and the uh, the, the sand sand table. Sand yes. table. And now we're in this large room here on the southeast corner. We're right here where this X is, and this is a community room. You, who was telling me that you were exactly? Here? And how is it used? Well, uh, agencies such as the Boy Scouts or the Girl Scouts might ask to use it for uh, for something. We've had uh, blood drives that we've sponsored in here or where members of the unit have given blood okay uh, at the end of a drill weekend now don mentioned uh, uh don uh, dixon that they can rent now do they have to boy scouts have to rent this if they were using it do you I, know i really don't know the, don't know uh, the okay. details as far as that but, but they have used it at least exactly and it's available through the the full-time okay. members that work here and so. they can check on that if you want if you're interested okay so just as an outline could you give me some idea what the other rooms here they sure were, this room over here in this other corner? That's the weight room, which is right across the hallway. Weight, and then? That's a classroom uh, cafeteria type thing. That's where we would have classes where we need more room than the briefing room. Okay. We'll, we'll wander around. Okay, okay, we'll wander around. This is where the, uh, the driveway sure. and the highway is here. Huh? Mm -hmm. Highway is, Route 3 runs over up and down on this side. Exactly. We'll just wander through and give you an idea of where we, where we are. Okay, we're in the, the weight room. Right. And I don't mean W-A-I-T either. It's not that kind of weight. <laughs> it's, this is the where, where you help to uh, perspire a little bit, work up a sweat, huh? Exactly. And it's available to people uh, just generally to get in shape or, you know, if, if they want to come down in the evenings when it's available. So the, the people who uh, are a member of the Guard can come here on other days like this and use the weight room and so forth? And we're also entitled to use the Air Force Base facilities. That was mentioned somewhere along there. You can use the their facilities. Exactly. We use the commissary, the post exchange, or the base exchange, uh, weight rooms, the theater. Uh -huh. A lot of the services that are available to the Air Force are also available to us. That, that's a